TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. It's your friendly neighborhood philosopher here, D. Wood. With me now is Etisham Gulam. How you doing? I doing good. You? Yeah. I, hey, hey, we've known each other for a long time, haven't we? Yeah, fourteen years. Fourteen years. Can you believe that? <laughs> that is a that's a long time. There's a long time. Yep. Yeah. So before, I, I've before, known... oh, before job before. Ali Dawa before I was way before those guys. <laughs> yeah. So, and I, yeah, I've known you a lot longer than I've known uh, most of my friends right now. So yeah, <laughs> we go, yeah, we go, we go way back and we debated. When was that? 2010, 2009, somewhere in there. 2009. Yeah. I, I remember that. That was a, uh, wow. It was 14 years ago. Wow. <laughs> long, long time ago. Um, but yeah, so why don't you go ahead and before we get started, and guys, we're going to keep this, uh, we're not going to be very strict about uh, time. We're going to keep it kind of organized and not uh, not arguing. Uh, we'll probably take, I don't know, five, eight, ten minutes or something each at the beginning to sort of lay out our general thoughts on the crucifixion of Jesus, um, and then we'll just keep it, uh, keep it friendly discussion format. But uh, here, before we get started, I want you to give everyone a little introduction to yourself and what you do and what you do on your channel oh okay uh for those of you who don't know me uh in case you're uh not familiar with me my name is Atisham Gulam. i've been a muslim apologist for i don't know like over 15 years now it's been over like 15 years i was before momadi job before ali dawa i was before all those guys i was before youtube i think I was, was i before youtube i think i was before youtube <laughs> so I'm, I'm way old school like me and uh, Emmy, uh, me and Emmy and Jay are the Muslim apologists started at the same time. So we were, we're at, uh, we we're way before like YouTube and all that. So yeah, my name's Atish Am Uh, You know, you probably seen my debates um, with Sam Shamoon and all those people. Uh, you know, I uh, I'm a Muslim apologist, as I've said. I'm a big comic book fan, as David would probably know. I'm a big comic book fan. See my. Uh, Batman shirt right there. <laughs> I was a DC fan, but uh, right now I'm playing. Uh, right now I am playing Spider-Man Two. So this game is pretty cool. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a big comic book fan. I probably know more about Marvel and DC than religion, as as I hate to admit it, but that's true. So I'm a big comic book fan. I'm a big, uh, you know, uh, Marvel DC fan and stuff like that. And I've been most apologist for a long time and. You know, my YouTube page should be in the uh, description below, Answering Christians 1. And, you know, I'm also friends with a lot of people like Bart Ehrman, uh, Richard Carrier, Robert M. Price. I'm friends with those atheist scholars of the uh, New Testament and uh, things like that. But I, I never got Ehrman on my channel because, you know, it's not going to go well if I have him on my channel. So, uh, you know, but I'm friends with Ehrman. I, I talk to him a lot on, on email and stuff like that. So uh, me and David Wood, we know the same people. Um, and we've, we're in contact with the same people, I guess, um, if you want to go into that atheist realm or atheistic scholar. So, yeah, I, I work at a hospital. You know, I got my uh, bachelor's and master's from Wayne State University. So I work at a hospital um, right now and actually got promoted uh, last month to hospital administrator. So now I'm, uh, I have more responsibilities. <laughs> So I can't be playing, you know, video games or reading comics that much anymore. But I always love, you know, doing this stuff in my spare time. So yeah, that's that's your friendly neighborhood, uh, most apologist dish. <laughs> All right. So um, <clears throat> we uh, one of the main dividing issues between uh, Christians and Muslims is uh, Jesus' death by crucifixion uh, and what actually happened. We have interestingly. Uh, some similarities with Muslims, like believing that God created the universe and that God has sent revelations and prophets. Um, even on Jesus, we agree that he was born of a virgin, that he performed all kinds of miracles, that he's the Messiah. And so we have these kinds of disagreements, and uh, it's just interesting you get to the crucifixion of Jesus, because here's an issue where, <clears throat> where lots of people actually agree scholars from pretty much across the spectrum so whether they're christian scholars uh, liberal christian scholars conservative christian scholars atheist scholars uh, occasional jewish scholars uh talk about this um but pretty much across the board everyone agrees 
that Jesus' death by crucifixion is a fact of history. And then the question becomes, what, what do you do with it? If you're an atheist, you say, okay, he's just another one of the thousands and thousands of crucifixion victims during the Roman Empire. Uh, Christians take it to be part of God's plan uh, as, a, as a, a core feature of salvation and so on. Um, and so it's just interesting that this is an area where Islam apparently disagrees, with, at least in its most prominent forms. There are uh, some minority positions um, that we can uh, maybe we'll talk about here in a little bit. But um, so as far as as far as the matter of fact, let me just let me just go ahead and quote quote some uh, some various scholars on this. Of course, you, you know it's it's quoting non Christian scholars here just because I, I don't want people. What's are that? you citing? Are you citing atheist, atheist scholars? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. Then I'll I'll, I'll respond to that. Go ahead. Yeah. No. 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 Just is just the beginning. So I'm going to take. Uh, I'll take a few oh. minutes to sort of just introduce my position, and then you could take uh, oh, sorry, five sorry, to ten no. minutes. No. You're. you're okay. No. No problem. No problem. Matter of fact, if you want to interrupt me, I, I don't care. Um. So we have Christians obviously agree that Jesus died by crucifixion, but uh, even there are New Testament scholars and historical Jesus scholars who are not Christians or who are, who are very little liberal Christians. So there are atheist New Testament scholars and historical Jesus scholars. There are, are agnostic New Testament and historical Jesus scholars. And it's interesting because some of the atheist and agnostic and Jewish scholars just regard this as an indisputable fact of history. So uh, atheist New Testament scholar Garrett Ludeman declares that Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. That's pretty strong language for, for a historian, right? Because, like, every, you're you're looking at documents and so on from many centuries ago. He says it's indisputable. John Dominic Crossan of the Jesus Seminar says that there is not the slightest doubt about the fact of Jesus' crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. Marcus Borg, another member of the Jesus Seminar, says that Jesus' execution is the most certain fact about the historical Jesus. If we know anything about Jesus, we know that he uh, was executed. Jewish scholar Pincus Lapid says that Jesus' death by crucifixion is historically certain. Uh, Paula Fredrickson, she's a convert to Judaism. She says the single most solid fact about Jesus' life is his death. He was executed by the Roman prefect Pilate on or around Passover in the manner Rome reserved, particularly for political insurrectionists, namely crucifixion. And of course, Bart Ehrman maintains one of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified on orders of the Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate. So again, this Bart Ehrman saying one of the most certain facts of history. So they obviously believe that there's quite a bit of evidence that Jesus was crucified. And so this is going to come down to various sources that we have, uh, even for people who think that Christians were making up lots of stuff back then. Uh, it's understood if you were going to make something up to convince people that that your guy is the Messiah, saying that he was crucified would probably not be something that you would make up. So there's no reason to make up a story about that. And... Uh, the, the sources agree that Jesus died by crucifixion. Scholars agree that Jesus died by crucifixion. There are theories about how he might have survived. These are usually, these ideas are usually based on not understanding how crucifixion works. Uh, it's a pretty, and it, it, artwork usually doesn't do the slightest bit of justice. So you'll have Jesus and he'll have some, some uh, blood coming out of his hands or wrists or something like this. Um, actual crucifixion, they would lash you with a, a flagrum, and that was uh, uh, sort of a whip with lots of tails, cat of nine tails, with chunks of bone and metal woven into the strands. It was designed to rip flesh. So um, if they hit you with it, it would sort of stick to your skin, chunks of metal would go in, and then they would rip it out. Uh, this was meant to This was meant to weaken you. They didn't want to be trying to nail... Uh, a 25, some 25 year old strapping young lad who rebelled against the empire. They don't want to be sitting there struggling with him on the ground, trying to nail this guy to a cross. Uh, the, just the beating, just the beating by itself was sometimes called the half death because victims would be half dead by just by the time the, the beating was finished. So after the beating, after they lashed you to a bloody mess, leaving your, uh, 
skin on your back hanging like ribbons leading your your leaving your um your arteries and veins exposed we actually have sores on people's intestines spilling out just from the beating itself i think it was around a quarter it was around a quarter of people died just from the beating so that's prior to even being nailed to the cross people are dying I and mean, then they nail you to a cross anyways as an example um but so it's so a horrible bloody process even before you are put on the cross and then of course you're nailed nailed to a cross and if you hang in in that position for a long time with your your arms uh, outstretched like that and all your body weight isn't that's why they put the nail through your heels if they just left you dangling it would become harder and harder for you to breathe and as you lost blood uh, you're just going to die more quickly so they put the nail through the heels and there are variations they could tie, they could tie your feet if they wanted to but uh, they put a nail through your heels so that as you're running out of breath, you you will actually just you will be you will be starving for oxygen. You will actually push yourself up to exhale because when your arms are outstretched and your your body weight's hanging on it, your muscles eventually start to give out, and your chest cavity is fully expanded. Your chest cavity is fully expanded, and it becomes very hard to exhale. So your breathing becomes very difficult, and so you push up just so you can breathe out, and then you can breathe back in. Anyway, it was a it was a very well developed method of execution and uh, extremely brutal and so from the perspective of a historian if you say so and so was crucified well that obviously means that that someone died there and so we've got the sources that talk about christian sources jewish sources roman sources uh talking about uh jesus crucifixion We've got uh, a, a historical consensus on Jesus' death by crucifixion. And eventually, eventually we get to some alternative theories. It's, it's interesting where these alternative theories come from. There were some groups, the Docetists and the Gnostics, who believed that Jesus was just a divine figure. He wasn't actually a human being. So if you got Jesus, and as Christians believe, he's, he's the incarnate son, uh, there are two basic there are two basic directions you can veer from that. You could say he was just human being, or you could say he was just some divine figure. The question for the Gnostics and the Docetists who held that position then became, well, if Jesus didn't actually have a human body, if he wasn't ac if he wasn't actually a human being, how could he have died by crucifixion? And then they had to come up with some explanations, and they started coming up with explanations like, Maybe someone else was disguised to make him look like Jesus, and this other person was crucified in Jesus' place. And so it's interesting that that eventually became the most popular uh, understanding in Islam. I say it's interesting because we know where the theory came from. We know where the theory came from. And where the theory came from was from people who were trying to explain how— Can you just give me one minute? Just, just one second. Sure. No problem. Hey, Etishem, can I keep talking, though? Yeah, go Okay, there. Yeah, so I'll just wrap up here. So. Yeah, um, I'm, so, I'm sorry. My, my parents are visiting, and, you know, you know how it is. Oh, you're good. You're good. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, oh, yeah, the, the Docetus and the Gnostics, so. The substitution theory? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so, yeah, we know where the theory came from, and it's just inter it's just fascinating that the theory, the theory came from people who believed that Jesus wasn't human, and so the idea that this took off in Islam eventually as the dominant theory is interesting because we know where the theory came from. And uh, most Muslims that I talk to think that that is the correct view according to the Quran. I have sort of changed my views on that over time. I'm kind of, right now, I'm kind of like 50-50 on whether the Quran is even... Well, I'm, I'm kind of 50-50 on whether the Quran is saying that Jesus didn't die. I'm kind of 50-50 on that. And on the issue of whether the Quran is actually promoting yeah. substitution theory. Oh, explain. I'm, yeah, 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 that's fine. Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and wrap up. As far as what I believe about what the Quran is saying. So now I'm like 50-50 on whether the Quran is even denying that Jesus uh, died by crucifixion. And I'm at like 20 to 30 percent on whether the Quran is advocating substitution theory. That's what, Yes, that's what you find in the Muslim commentaries later on. Uh, and that became the dominant view. The Quran isn't exactly clear on what it's talking about. And so that's just kind of an overview to set up the discussion. But now, uh, Etishem, if you want to take five or ten minutes and, and 
just give your kind of overview on all of these issues and then we can we can discuss things. Yeah, I mean, I agree that, you know, uh, so here's where here's where I agree with David Wood. I agree that Jesus was crucified like and if that's blowing Muslims mind, let me, let me explain here. The Quran says, well, let me read the Quranic verse. Let me just read the Quran. It says, it's talking about, the Quran chapter 4, verse 157 is what we're talking about here. We're talking about one Quranic verse and possibly another Quranic verse is the Quran chapter 3, verse 55, where Allah says, oh, Jesus, I'll take you and I'll raise you to myself. Now, um, I've seen David Wood's videos and I've responded to it on my channel. Uh, but the Quran chapter 4, verse 157, let me just begin there. It says, the Jews said, we killed Jesus, the Christ, the son of Mary. But the Quran says they didn't kill him, nor did they crucify him. It was made to appear to them. And those who differ follow nothing but conjecture and uh, guesswork. Uh, but surely they killed him not. And the Quran chapter 4, verse 157 ends with, uh, you know, uh, they killed him not. And the, Quran, and the next verse says, Allah raised him to himself. Now, here's where I disagree with, uh, with classical Muslim commentaries, and I'll explain why I disagree. Now, notice what the Quran says. It says, it was made to appear to them. It was made to appear to them. Even if you read in Arabic, it was made to appear to them does not mean somebody else was crucified instead of Jesus. Uh, you know, if you read the Quran chapter 5, verse 33, the Quran uh, mentions crucifixion as death, like death on the cross uh, by the method of uh, crucifixion. The Quran is saying, the Quran is, uh, is, is saying that Jesus was not killed by the method of crucifixion. You see what I'm saying? So what these Muslim scholars, what these early Muslim scholars like Ibn Kathir, Ibn Abbas, uh, El Jawa, Dain, etc., why they said somebody else was crucified instead of Jesus, even though there's no evidence for that in the first century, uh, you know, in the New Testament, is because they took an extremely literal view of that Quranic verse. It was made to appear to them. They thought that Jesus wasn't even crucified. That somebody else, somebody else had to have been crucified because they didn't know how to like make sense of that Quranic passage, other than their extreme literal view of that of that passage. Uh, so I think David Wood is right when he says it possibly comes from the Basilians or the Do Docetics, the, Do Do uh, the Docetic, a early Christian group that said Jesus was so divine he couldn't be crucified to begin with. I think that's where it comes from. But there's a really good book. Uh, which Shabir Ali uh, mentions, it's called Christ in Islam by Neil Robinson. And he traces the so-called substitution theory to northern Iraq in the second century. Uh, are those, those stories came from northern Iraq and I believe the 8th century. Or something. So the Quran never says somebody else was crucified instead of Jesus. The Prophet Muhammad never said somebody else was crucified instead of Jesus. So that view that somebody else was crucified instead of Jesus, although it's found in Ibn Kathir and Ibn Abbas and all that, they took an extremely literal view, but that's not what the Quran is saying. The Quran says it was made to appear to them. So my view that I've always held on to, and I've uh, said this in my debate with you years ago and with Mary Jo Sharp, is that Jesus was crucified, but he survived the crucifixion. That is what I think the Quran chapter 4 verse 157 is talking about there. And Shabir Ali holds this view. Uh, the late Ahmad Dat also holds this view, even though that is he is a controversial uh, Muslim preacher. Uh, I don't think Zakir Naik holds this view. I don't I don't believe so. But um, uh, or I think Zakir Naik does hold it, but he, he says it's not the correct Islamic interpretation. So let's just go. So me and Shabir Ali agree that Jesus was crucified. I think that's certain. Now, Muslims will disagree with us. Muslims will disagree with me. Muslims have disagreed with me on my channel, but I think the evidence is very strong that Jesus was crucified on the cross. So if David Wood wants to hammer that point, or he wants to, you know, um, uh, say that's historical, that Jesus was crucified. I agree. Jesus was crucified. I think that's the best uh, it's, it's verified by, you know, the New Testament, Josephus, Tacitus, whatever. So uh, my view is that Jesus was crucified, but he didn't die on the cross. Now, David Wood cited, uh, how many atheist scholars did you cite, David? Five or six or something? 
Uh, yeah, something like that. Okay, so he cites atheist scholars, Gerd Luderman, Bart Ehrman, uh, Paula Fredrickson, if I'm remembering correctly. So the reason why atheists say that Jesus was crucified is because they don't believe in the supernatural, right? So if a man lived 2,000 years ago and he's crucified, given their atheistic, anti-supernatural, liberal views, of course they're going to say he died on the cross. Because if a man lived 2,000 years ago and he's crucified— Given atheist, given their atheistic uh, views, of course they're going to say he died. Of course, like you know, like that—that's just their atheistic or humanistic approach to things. But I think David was being inconsistent here, and the reason why I'm saying this is because the atheists, like I said, don't believe in the supernatural. So of course they're going to say Jesus died two thousand years ago. They're going to they're going to say that. But the problem is David Wood, as a theist, as a Christian, believes in the supernatural. He believes in miracles. He believes. And, uh, you know, the virgin birth, he believes that God split the sea for Moses. He believes that Elijah went to heaven uh, without dying. He believes in, uh, you know, the Old Testament story of Enoch going to heaven without dying. So I think David Wood is being inconsistent here um, because he does believe in the supernatural. But when he's citing these atheist scholars, of course they're going to say Jesus died on the cross. Because if a man lived 2,000 years ago and given atheistic views, if he's crucified, and given their anti-supernatural views, of course they're going to say, you know, he died on the cross. You know, of course they're going to say that. I mean, why wouldn't they say that? Christians also have a theological view. I saw one of David Wood's videos. Um, uh, I, I think it's How Can God Die or something like that. I responded to it on my channel. And my view is that, of course, Christians are going to say Jesus died too. It's because they have a theological reason for believing it. But. Um, and then uh, David Wood cites the criteria of embarrassment. I, I took some notes here, and um, this this criteria doesn't work either because, of course, people are going to make up non-flattering stories about Jesus, about the prophet Muhammad after they died for political reasons, sectarian reasons, uh, theological reasons, you name it. The, the criteria of embarrassment does not work, you know, in proving Jesus died on the cross or trying to show that the gospel writers didn't have motive to. Um, invent something like that. So my view is that Jesus was crucified, but he survived. And atheists and Christians can't disprove my view because my view is a supernatural or a theological view. Why can't God keep Jesus alive? Uh, you know, that, that's certainly possible, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, given, you know, given my theological view. So Christians, I think Christians are inconsistent when they criticize the uh, spoon theory or the theory that Jesus was crucified. Uh, and he survived. Um, yeah, Dave, if you want to, if you want to respond or if you want me to keep going. Um, yeah, a couple, couple of issues there. So I'll go ahead and respond to those, uh, <clears throat> those points you just made. And then I'd like to bring up the passages, but just because there will be people there, there are always people who are kind of new to this, so they don't even understand. They don't understand what we're talking about. We're talking about Surah four verse one fifty seven. So we'll actually uh, pull the verses up on the screen, and so we can we can we can uh, uh, yeah, yeah we can break down what what we mean here. So as far as um, <clears throat> now, uh, let me say let me say uh, here at the beginning, as far as Etisham saying that we we believe in the supernatural, so we believe that God could miraculously keep someone alive, even a victim of crucifixion. Absolutely, totally agree with him on that. God could uh, have someone go through a thousand crucifixions and survive. So we're talking about God here. Of course, God could do that. Um, the question is, why would we believe something like that? Why would we believe that God uh, had Jesus crucified or allowed him to be crucified, but then miraculously sustained him throughout that so that he actually survived? So that's a... That's a if I can inter interject just just for one quick second, um, you know, if you read the Old Testament, like when I read the Bible, people survived or God saved people. God saved uh, Jonah. And I know Christians have responded to the sign of Jonah argument, but God, uh, you know, saved Jonah. God, uh, according to the Bible, uh, you know, Yahweh Elohim, whatever you know, God's name is, he, uh, he saved, uh, what do you call it, Enoch, or he raised Enoch to himself, Elijah was saved, so these people were saved, so why can't the same thing be done with, with Jesus, you know, like the Old, like the New Testament uses the Old Testament, uh, you know, to prove various things Jesus said, et cetera, et cetera, so that's just my, uh, my, my, my view is that why can't God do the same for Jesus? Uh, yes, yeah, so, 
yeah, again, no no disagreement between us there. Uh, as far as if we're talking about the supernatural, yes, Elvis could still be alive, preserved somewhere by God. Tupac could still be alive, preserved somewhere by God. All these things are are eminently possible. Um, the question is, why would we believe them? So, some if someone wanted to say, I believe that Tupac is still alive, not just that it was not just that it was some uh, some show or something like this or some conspiracy, but that actually, nope, he, guys loaded, uh, unloaded bullets into him and then God miraculously sustained him and then uh, kept him alive afterwards. Uh, of course, God could do that. The question is, should we actually believe that God uh, did do that? So um, anyway, on the issue of uh, being inconsistent. Uh, you, know, so, you, know, so, you, know what, you know what's funny? The Tupac has an album called Resurrection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's there's a funny there's a funny Chappelle skit about uh tupac you should check yeah it out. yeah, I, yeah. I, I love it i wrote the i wrote the song a long time ago wrote the song a long time yeah that's good um anyway so as far as as far as citing atheists that's not uh the the issue on on citing atheists and uh jewish scholars and so on of course we have diff disagreements but that's kind of the point it's Christian scholars and Jewish scholars would disagree a lot on the life of Jesus. Christians and atheists would disagree a lot when it comes to the life of Jesus. But everyone across the board agrees that he died by crucifixion. And so it's a it's a rare area where people agree. And so the point is not is not citing an atheist and therefore the the atheist is right. I think the I think the atheists are are wrong about lots and lots of things, really, really important things. The point is that people who ordinarily disagree with us on all of these big issues on this issue agree. And you're pointing out that, well, this is 2000 years ago. And of course, if someone is crucified, the atheist is not going to assume that uh, that God is going to uh, miraculously keep that person alive. You're right. That, that option wouldn't be open to them, just as Jesus rising from the dead, as Christians believe, would not be open to the atheist. So uh, we, uh, you and I, Etishem, are in agreement that we we sort of have a belief about what happened that is miraculous that atheists are going to object to. And yet, if there were if there just weren't any evidence for Jesus crucifixion, the atheists would not be agreeing with us and saying it's an indisputable fact. They'd say, "How do we know what happened? It was a long time ago. We have no idea what happened." So anyway, the point is there there's something here that is even convincing uh, critical scholars like Bart Ehrman and so on. That this is a fact of history. Uh, the, I mean, the the Jesus seminar. They go kind of saying by saying and, and pick and choose what they believe, but they uh, agree on this issue. And so it's just an interesting fact that uh, people agree on this. As far as the um, criterion of embarrassment, that's ju that's just a situation of how how do how do we account for the early belief in Jesus' death arising? even among his followers, because his followers go to their horrible, bloody deaths, claiming that he died on the cross and rose from the dead. So, if I can, yeah, if I can interject. <clears throat> yeah, there, let's, yeah, let me finish the point, and then you can jump in. Right. So the idea is these guys are first century Jews. First century Jews didn't really have a concept that the Messiah is going to come and die. That's why they uh, kind of, that's why it kind of catches people off guard when Jesus um, dies. Um they didn't have really a concept of a of a dying Messiah, dying and rising Messiah. And so if you were a first century Jew and you wanted to come up with a story, that's that's the point of the principle of embarrassment. If you're going to invent something, you're going to invent something that that helps your case. If you're a first century Jew trying to convince other first century Jews that Jesus is the Messiah, saying he died is not going to help your case. So why would you then invent it? It sounded like you were saying, well, people can sort of spread uh, malicious stories about a person, like about Muhammad or about Jesus afterwards. But this isn't just this isn't something that's that's coming along from some uh, some some critics of Jesus later. I mean, of course, critics agree that he died. They would throw that in. They would throw that in, in Christian's face. Come on, he's the Messiah. He, he, the guy got crucified. But that's the point. Everyone's agreeing. It's the Christian saying he was crucified and there's a point to it. And there's the critics saying he was crucified and this exposes him. What's what the underlying agreement among everyone is that he was crucified. So if he wasn't crucified, if Jesus wasn't, if Jesus didn't die by crucifixion and the critics were to say, ha ha ha, he got crucified and he hadn't, 
the response of Jesus followers and people who believed in Jesus would have been, what are you talking about? He wasn't crucified. Or, uh, yeah, he was crucified, but he was still he was still around later. He survived it. And this shows that God was actually protecting him. That would have that would have been a miraculous claim too. saying that he miraculously survived. This would have been a, a, mira a miracle claim, too. So the point is, when you look at when you look at the evidence, when you look at the evidence, just as far as what people are saying and what people are believing during that time, the, the critics of Christianity and the uh, proponents of Christianity. And you say, how did these people come to their come to these views? Well, a Jesus who didn't die on the cross kind of doesn't explain, just doesn't explain how these people uh, came to believe these things. If there were, uh, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me clarify that just to go along with, with what you were saying. If we wanted to say that Jesus was crucified, but didn't die from the crucifixion, he was crucified, but he didn't die. He survived by divine help. Um, I think the only way to make sense of the evidence is even Jesus' own followers thought that he died, even though, so God saved him, God miraculously saved him, but even Jesus' own followers were convinced that he died. And so it was kind of a secret until it would come along, it would come along later. That's the only way that I could actually uh, account for the evidence. And this is going to eventually lead into the questions about the character of God. If, if God is doing these things that are, that are misleading all these people and leading all these people astray, and no one has any idea what happened, and then we get down to the present, and billions of people are convinced that Jesus died on the cross because Allah just didn't clarify what he was doing, uh, we're going to have some issues there. But what, yeah, what are, your, what are your thoughts on all this? Uh, wait, one, 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 one second, because uh, we are getting super chats. Let me just uh, read these real quick, and then... Um, uh, I would bring more shekels, but AP is not here. Yeah, this is a no, this is a no atheist zone right now, ladies and gentlemen. We don't want atheists in here messing everything up. Um, Sheikh Wingaling says, after constant bullying from D. Wood, I have converted to Islam in order to justly get my revenge. That's uh, Mike Winger there. Would not surprise me. Would not surprise me with uh, Mike Winger. Uh, if Allah made them believe he was crucified, why did he lie about it? Happy Holy Week, everybody. Uh, let me see. If Allah made them believe he was crucified, why did he have to lie about it? You want me, you want me, to, you want me to respond? Yeah, I don't fully understand the question, but if you get it, go ahead and respond. Okay, well, you, you made up, uh, are you... Uh, Taught, you made a lot of assertions. Let me let me address those assertions, and then maybe I can address that those those questions or whatever. Well, you say that uh, you talk about the disciples of Jesus, and I think that's that's an interesting point that you and Mike Lacona brought up. I remember watching a debate with uh, Mike Lacona and Shabir Ali way back in two thousand five, two thousand four. Uh, Shabir Ali and Mike Lacona. This was pre YouTube. <laughs> You know, that's how old I am. I'm like pre YouTube. Yeah, yeah I was so, at, I was at that debate. Oh, you were? Okay. Yeah. Matter of so, fact, my, matter of fact, matter of fact, right before the debate, I took Shabir Ali. I, I was no one had any clue who I was back then, but Shabir Ali was coming to town and uh the passion of the Christ had just come out. I just messaged him. I said, Hey, I don't know if this is gonna come up in the debate, but uh it may come up in the Q and A about since this is a popular movie right now. So you might want to go ahead and see it and then he messaged me back and he said, uh, no, I don't, I don't think I'll, I don't think I'll have a chance. Uh, I don't know if anyone's is going. And I said, I mean, I'll, I'll take you to, I'll take you to see it. So I actually took Shabir to see the passion of the Christ, uh, before the debate. So anyway, that was, uh, that was, yeah. Point was, yep. that was way back in the day, ladies and gentlemen, this is right around the time the passion of the Christ came out, which is before most of you who are watching this, uh, were even born. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's funny. It's funny you say that because like, uh, after that debate, I saw Spider Man Two, and there's this really, there's this really good, uh, there's this really good scene in Spider Man Two. This is back in 2004. Passion in Spider Man Two yeah. came out. Keep in mind, we're talking about the Tobey Maguire Spider Man here, Tobey ladies and gentlemen. That's what we're talking about. So, anyways, there's this really good scene in uh, Spider Man Two that reminds me of Mel Gibson's uh, Passion of the Christ, where Spider Man, he's like Peter Parker, he takes off his mask, he's he's stopping the train. And oh, I remember like that. Yeah, really, yeah, it has like this really good. Uh, Christ imagery mm -hmm. on it. So I, I kind of made that connection where uh, the the Sam Raimi was making that Christ connection with Spider-Man and uh, 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 the passion or like Jesus, Jesus symbolism. So, I mean, I love Marvel movies and, and comic books like 
you know, even before I got into this stuff. But anyways, uh, talking, uh, getting to your point, um, well, you say, well, the disciples, and I remember Mike Lacona brought that point up with Shabir Ali, and I don't think Shabir Ali addressed that point. Because I think Mike Lacona, he he was onto something, but Shabir Ali didn't respond to it because of time restraints or, or whatever. But the problem with that claim is that it, with the disciples believing in um, Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, there's a serious problem. And the problem is that that claim is contingent or that claim is dependent on the, the on the reliability of the New Testament. Because we know Peter didn't write down anything. We know uh, James didn't write down anything. We know that... Uh, you know, the, the other disciples, you know, Andrew, et cetera, Bartholomew, they didn't write down anything. And I have just Bart Ehrman's uh, forged right here. Now, I know Bart Ehrman's an atheist. I know, you know, Christians don't like him. So basically, Ehrman in this book, Forge, talks about how Peter could not have written one Peter. He couldn't have written two Peter. It couldn't have possibly came from the disciples because the disciples, according to Ehrman's view, spoke Aramaic, but the uh, New Testament documents are written in Greek, sophisticated, like, advanced college-level Greek. So I think Ehrman has a good point there that it's possible that the New Testament documents did not come from the disciples, but came from the second generation of believers, possibly Paul's, uh, Paul's you know, uh, followers, etc. So there's a serious problem with saying that the disciples believed in Jesus' death and resurrection, because first of all, the disciples didn't write down anything, and second of all, uh, uh, there's no evidence that the New Testament actually comes from the disciples. Then uh, David Wood talks about, well, what about the disciples of Jesus going to their deaths for believing, uh, you know, Jesus' death and, re and resurrection? Well, there's a serious problem with that because, first of all, nowhere in the New Testament is there anything about anybody dying for their belief about Jesus' alleged death and resurrection. Nowhere in the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts of the Apostles, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, Revelation, etc. Nor does it say that the disciples went and died for their belief. So the New Testament doesn't record any of that. The second problem is that, uh, is that these stories like Acts of Peter, where Peter is crucified upside down, etc., uh, come from the late 2nd and 3rd century years i think like decades years after the new testament was written like i think 180 200 years after so these legends of jesus disciples going to their deaths allegedly going to their deaths comes from these gnostic or these uh uh new testament apocryphal works that came years later and uh you know historians don't accept that like ehrman doesn't um accept that Jesus' disciples died because he looked at the source and he says, well, they're all fanciful, legend, legendary um, works. I think Mike Lacona, too, uh, I think, he, I believe that he talked about how there's those are unreliable records, Acts of Peter, Acts of John, where the disciples went to their, to their deaths and stuff like that. So my point is that these are late records. So that that view that the Jesus' disciples believed that um, he died by the resurrection or you know, they believed in his death and resurrection comes from the New Testament. And there's a serious problem because if you read what conservative scholars say, Christian scholars like Raymond Brown, uh, uh, Bruce Metzger, uh, Craig Al Blomberg, they say that the Gospels are anonymous, were written by anonymous Greek authors. So how can I trust people that we don't even know where they came from? Like Raymond Brown, Introduction to the New Testament, pages 108, 158, 208, 267, the Gospels were anonymous. And later on, these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, were put in there in the second century. Cla Craig L. Blomberg, a conservative Christian, not an atheist, says that the Gospels are eternally anonymous. So there's a problem with David Wood's view uh, that the disciples, that we know that the disciples believe that they uh, that Jesus died uh, by crucifixion and, and resurrection because it comes from these unreliable uh, documents. So David Wood's theory... Um, doesn't match up or there's serious flaws in his in his view uh quick uh, quick 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 question on on yeah. those issues <clears throat> so you're talking about these uh being based on unreliable sources uh can't trust them and yet here again we find non-christians atheists and atheist scholars and jewish scholars um agreeing with christians on this point again so uh, uh gerd ludemann says it may be taken as historically certain 
that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. So Gerd Ludemann's an atheist. He doesn't believe that Jesus actually appeared. He says that it's hist it's historically certain that they were convinced that Jesus appeared to them somehow. <clears throat> and so as a... Uh, as an atheist, there's a question of what you're going to do with that. Describe it in terms of hallucinations or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but they agree. They agree that the disciples must have had some sort of experiences that they're interpreting this way. Bart Ehrman says, we can say with complete certainty. I want to keep drawing attention to the, the language they're using. When they're talking about the crucifixion, it's, this is historically certain. This is indisputable and so on. These are the <clears throat> These are critics of Christianity. Garrett Ludeman says it's historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences which they, uh, in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Bart Ehrman says we can say with complete certainty that some of his disciples at some later time insisted that he soon appeared to them, convincing them that he had been raised from the dead. Paula Fredrickson says, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. I'm not saying that they really did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw. But I do know, as a historian, that they may have seen something, <clears throat> and they yeah. bait. What's that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, if I can interject here, right, right. It, they, if you read Gerd Luderman's book, Bart Ehrman's book, all, all those atheist scholars that you're just citing, they say Jesus came back as a vision. Because if you read one Corinthians fifteen, chapter uh, one Corinthians fifteen, uh, verses one to eight, it says Jesus appear to Paul the same way he appeared to Peter, James, etc., and to 12. So these atheists that you're citing say that Jesus came back as a vision. And I, that's something I agree with. And I'll get into, I'll get into that. Um, uh, I'll, I'll get into that right now is because what I think happened is that I, there's this really good book called uh, Daniel A. Smith, the empty tomb, where Daniel A. Smith says that according to the Q gospel, which predates Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which predates the New Testament documents. Daniel A. Smith argues that in the Q gospel, it talks about Jesus' disappearance and not his uh, resurrection. Uh, and the Q gospel is early. It's early. It's earlier than, uh, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So according to my view is that when Jesus was crucified, he was taken down. He was put in the tomb, and from the tomb, he was taken into heaven. Because if you read the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, nobody sees Jesus rise from the dead. Nobody sees the resurrection. So I think that's a big problem for the resurrection um, uh, narrative. Uh, you know, if you, if you want to comment on that. Um, no, 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 I'm just saying, uh, <clears throat> if someone has seen a vision, keep in mind, people, people back then did not have problems seeing visions. That's pretty normal. That's pretty normal. Uh, in fact, the, the reason that in the Gospels you see Jesus saying, hey, put, put, your, put your finger into my wound and so on, is because that's exactly what someone would have thought. If, if you saw a guy get crucified, right? If, this is, if crucifixion is a public event, someone dies, you find out the Romans crucified your guy, guess what? You need to go find another guy because your guy's dead. If that guy were somehow to appear later on and you actually see him, no one is going to conclude resurrection. They're not going to conclude resurrection. They're going to conclude that that this is some sort of vision or ghost or something like that. That's what they would conclude. No one's going to conclude resurrection unless they think it's actually a physical resurrection. So the disciples going out and maintaining that Jesus has been has been resurrected. That's a claim that his body has been raised. And so it's here again, we're left with we're left with the evidence and what explains the evidence. Well, if first century Jews are concluding that a man has been resurrected and they're saying things like, wow, and we're going to be glorified, and we're going to get a re we're going to be resurrected like this. Just seeing some vague, just seeing a vision or something like that doesn't really account for that. Now, you're you're pointing out that that's a that's a direction that atheists would have to go in. Why? Well, they don't actually believe in a resurrection. If you're an atheist. And you believe, and and Ehrman, I talked to Ehrman about this, and he agrees that Peter, Paul, and Mary, at the very least, all had to believe that they were seeing the risen Jesus. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that interview. Yeah, I saw yeah. that interview. Yeah. So, and, and and it's because you have very different reasons for why they're concluding that Jesus uh, rose from the dead. So, with Peter, something has to has to uh, set off the the apostles. And it's multiply attested. In other words, we have it in multiple places that Jesus appeared to Peter. 
um, something had to persuade the other apostles. And in our sources, we have the group appearances. That's even tougher for an atheist to grant because if I see something, you can always say it's my in my mind or a vision or something like that. If a group of people see it now, now you've got uh, something else. So Ehrman doesn't grant the group appearances. He grants Peter because something has to explain how the disciples concluded that Jesus had risen from the dead. Uh, Mary, uh, he didn't explain why he believes it. I don't recall him explaining why he believes Mary in particular, but that would be, an, uh, that, I'm guessing that would be another principle of embarrassment. Why is this woman introduced as a witness of the risen Jesus? It wouldn't have helped your case. So it just seems like there was, in the first century, a woman named Mary who was known for seeing Jesus. And then Paul, because he's an enemy, so he's not going to be persuaded by Peter. He, he, he would have he would, he would, he would, he would hated Peter before he became a Christian. So how do you account for uh, Paul's Paul's transformation? And so oh. Ehrman, Ehrman, Ehrman uh, grants the appearances to those three. And so that's the data that we have. I would say we have a lot. I would say we have a lot more data, but just going with that, just going with what an, a an atheist critic of Christianity, uh, who's been studying this uh, most of his life, just going with the evidence there, uh, what's the best explanation? And the thing is, if it's just a vision, it's really weird that it's happening to men and women, friends and foes. There were lots of people claiming to be the Messiah back in the day. If they died, that was it. Jesus just happens to be the guy who he dies, and then everyone starts concluding that he was appearing to them, risen from the dead. So there's this idea that he's appearing to multiple sort of different kinds of people. And there's the issue that they're concluding that he's been raised from the dead, that he's been resurrected. Again, none of these people would have had a problem with seeing a vision. None of them would have had a problem with seeing a vision. None of them would have had a problem with the idea of their guy dying, dying on the cross, and then God giving them a vision just to know that he's okay. Just for God to say, hey guys, you know, I know your guy was crucified, but don't worry. He's here. He's all safe. He's all safe and sound. None of them would have had a problem with that. And that would have been very natural for them to interpret the evidence like that. In other words, you see Jesus, wow, I'm getting an awesome vision. Um, or if you did see him, if you did see him somehow after the crucifixion and he had survived, he would have been so horribly injured, they would have said, wow, he amazingly survived. Let's get him some uh, medical help. Yeah, the I, point is, yeah, I'm just saying, so So the, the takeaway here is we're looking for why resurrection became the position of the Christians. It had to be something pretty big that convinces them of resurrection, not uh, vision or ghost or something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you packed in you packed in a lot. Let me try to respond to all of it in, in the time I have. So I, I got Bart Ehrman's book right here, How Jesus Became God. I, lo I really like this book. It's filled with good scholarship, et cetera, et cetera. I don't agree with everything. Now, I don't agree with everything Ehrman says. I'm a Muslim, so obviously I don't agree with like everything he says. Uh, given my theological views or my views of the supernatural, et cetera. So the position I've always held, again, is that Jesus was crucified, but he survived. Now, David Wood's saying, well, there's problems with it because of X, Y, Z. Now, well, Ehrman says in this book that uh, how Jesus became God, they had visions of Jesus. Uh, you know, and I think he proves this point really well, but we're trying to keep this short, so I, I don't have time. So I would just recommend getting this book, How Jesus Became God. Uh, it's a really good book, has really good views of scholarship, et cetera. So David Wood points out that uh, how do we how do we recall these these appearances? Well, if you read Galatians one, I believe Galatians one chapter chapter one verses eleven to uh, twelve, Paul says, uh, you know, he got a revelation from Jesus. So that means that and he saw Jesus the same way the disciples saw Jesus in one Corinthians uh, fifteen. Chapter 15, verses 1 to 8, it says Jesus appeared to, you know, the disciples, etc. So the question really arises, where is Paul getting his information from? He's not getting it from the disciples, and he's not getting it from, you know, he's not getting his information from the disciples. He's getting it from his visions or his own um, subjective revelations, because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, Galatians 1, that I did not receive the gospel from any man, nor was I taught it. That's an important part. I taught it. I received it by revelation. So Paul is getting his information about the death and resurrection, not from the disciples, but from his reading of the Old Testament in Revelations. He says this in 1 Corinthians 15, Galatians 1, etc. So 
Again, we don't know what the disciples believe because that's contingent on the New Testament. And like I said, there are Christian scholars who say that the Gospels are anonymous. Raymond Brown says this, Craig L. Blomberg uh, says this, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, you don't have any historical documents, uh, reliable historical documents talking about Jesus' disciples believing that. And uh, my view, like I said, is that according to the Q Gospel, Daniel A. Smith argues this, is that Jesus was crucified, taken down, and put in the tomb, and from the tomb, he was taken into heaven. That explains the empty tomb, and that explains why people like Paul had visions and Peter had visions, etc. Because you decided uh, Bart Ehrman, but Bart Ehrman says that there were visions. Jesus' disciples had visions of of uh, of uh, Jesus after the crucifixion. So Ehrman doesn't necessarily agree with your views. Um, so that's that explains the empty tomb because from the tomb he was taken into heaven, according to the Q Gospel. Because Jesus says, "You will not see me," etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, again, you know, this this claim is I I, th I don't think it's a good claim um, for uh, for the resurrection story, resurrection narratives, etc. So yeah, David, hey, if you want to, what, yeah. what what's that uh what's that book called? Uh, How Jesus became God. No, no, no the uh, the uh, one you're talking about with the Q. Uh, Daniel A. Smith, uh, the Empty Tomb. Uh, I, I believe Shabir Ali cited that in his debate with with you and Michael Kona. Uh, so I, after I read that parts of that book, um, he talks about the Q Gospel, which again predates Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it talks about Jesus' disappearance and not his uh, not his resurrection. So what Jesus says in uh, let me see if I can get it here. Jesus says in Matthew 23, 29, and Luke chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus says, you will not see me until the end of days. So Daniel A. Smith argues in his book, The Post-Mortem Vindication of Jesus. And uh, the read, read that, read that, read that title again for us. Uh, the Post-Mortem Vindication of Jesus and the Sayings Gospel Q by Daniel A. Smith. What does uh, po post-mortem mean? Death. But oh, okay. I, I see. I see what you're. I see what Aha. you're going. <laughs> yeah, D oh. he does not believe Jesus survived. That's the point. So, yeah, but there's. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah. His his a commentary on the Q document, which by the way we don't have. Uh, we don't have Q. We have quotations from Q, and Q's theoretical, whether it's an actual document or just uh, oral oral sayings. But you find you find elements of Q. It basically occurs when something. Just, just for people who are who are new here, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, Matthew and Luke were apparently familiar with Mark because sometimes they're quoting something and it's it sounds exactly like it was in Mark. So the idea is that they're familiar with Mark and they're getting they're getting this from Mark. Um, but other times they're they they have the same thing. Matthew and Luke have the same uh, passage, but it's not in Mark. And so uh, people have basically pieced together the material that is in Matthew and Luke, but not in Mark, where it looks like Matthew and Luke are drawing from a common source, and they call this Q. But it's sayings. It's not Jesus went around and did this and that. It's a collection of sayings. And so you're limited to kind of the, the things that Jesus is, is quoting. And uh, yeah, so I, I, yeah. I'd, be, I'd be really interested in seeing what it is in Q, the sayings document that somehow shows that Jesus didn't die when the book of the guy who wrote the book is, is, about, is called, it's, it's about post-mortem. It's about what happened to Jesus post-mortem, so after death. So his position is not that Jesus miraculously survived crucifixion. That's how Shabir, Shabir basically is, is striving for anything that kind of confirms his view. And so he goes to that and he takes something from that and then he'll go to this German scholar and combine it with something that and he'll like Frankenstein yeah. together. He'll Frankenstein together a position. Yeah, I mean, I, what is Daniel? Is he a Christian or atheist? I don't uh, I don't know. Is he a is he a theist? Uh, I don't know. I, I, Mike, Mike Lacona knows him from conferences. I'd, I'd never heard of him until Shabir brought him up. Okay, so I don't know. I don't know if he's a Christian or an atheist, or but uh, my point is, I've always held the view that Jesus survived the crucifixion. I've always held that because when I looked at the evidence, the evidence is very you strong. Mean, so you mean like you've always held the view that Jesus was put on the cross, yep. but survived, but he survived. 
yeah, that's the view I will always hold on to because I that's the view I believe is historically certain. And I think William Lane Craig says it's virtually certain that Jesus was crucified and he was put in the empty tomb. And he has other points that I don't remember, but I remember he has five points. He says, well, uh, Jesus was crucified. There was He was put in the tomb by Joseph of Arimathea and the empty tomb, uh, there was an empty tomb. So, uh, you know, my view was always that Jesus was crucified, but he survived because when I looked at the substitution theory, um, it actually, it doesn't make any sense because I think you said, I think you said it best in other videos where why would Allah deceive disciples, deceive the followers of Jesus into tricking somebody else? And it's a dishonorable thing. The substitution is a dishonorable thing because why would God miraculously disguise somebody to go on the cross? It doesn't, to me, it doesn't make any sense, mm -hmm. right? Like it doesn't make any sense. And the other problem is the disciples um, believe that he was crucified, but we don't know if they believed that he died or survived or whatever, because like I said, the gospels are uh, notoriously uh, unreliable in this. So I believe Jesus was crucified. The substitution theory is a mess because it causes a lot of problems. So I, I agree with you that the substitution theory makes no sense whatsoever. Um, uh, and the Quran says it was made to appear to them. But I, I think uh, I think Shabir Ali does have a good point. Uh, because the Q gospel talks about the disappearance. Now, I don't know what Daniel A. Smith's theological views are. I don't know if he's a Christian or an atheist. It, it seems like he's an atheist, but like you said, if he's an atheist, of course he's going to say the poor mortem vindication because, you know, he, um, he doesn't believe in the supernatural because if a man lived 2,000 years ago, is crucified, like I said, they're going to say, they're going to conclude that he died. But as a theist, you're a, you and me are theists. We believe in the supernatural. We believe in miracles. So why can't God keep Jesus alive? Uh, but this, but Dieter, Dieter Zeller argues that Jesus was taken alive from the tomb into heaven, that German scholar. Again, I don't know. Yeah, what that's what Sha that's what Shabir Ali does. I can't even find a source by this guy. This is this is the ongoing. This is the these are the ongoing problems that, and I just want to say, Etishem, this is uh, this is a problem I see with. Uh, so you, you take Shabir Ali. So he has a position, and then it's not. Let me just look at this and go where the evidence points. It's. It's like he he has a prior commitment to Islam, so he has to defend that view. But like you, he rejects the uh, the standard view, and it's like he goes out and looks for stuff to kind of Frankenstein together a a, a a case for it. But again, he'll 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 cite this guy in his book about what happened to Jesus post mortem and so on, and say, see if we take what this guy says about the Q source and we combine it with this German scholar and so on, we do this, and it's like that's the actual case of the evidence is no one has had any clue what's happened for 2000 years until we get to this guy who's talking, who agrees that Jesus died, but you're going to combine it with this German scholar that we can't find anything from and so on and kind of piece together and say, see, this makes sense. Well, no, that kind of, that, that kind of doesn't, uh, kind of doesn't make sense. And, but I mean, just even think of the method of, of trying to do that. We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We've got Paul. We've got uh, we've got the the second generation of Christian writers. And by the way, you're saying, oh, you know, the references. We don't have references to the martyrdoms. Clement of Rome is first century. Clement of Rome is first century. He refers to the martyrdoms of both Peter and Paul. And th these these are guys. Some of these guys are guys who actually knew the original apostles. So we have a we we have a pretty darn good idea of what the, we have an unbroken chain going back to the apostles. Even if you wanted to reject. I think uh, uh, William Lane Craig, if I can interject, William Lane Craig and Mike Lacona don't, uh, they, I believe it was Mike Lacona or William Lane Craig, I don't remember, but one of these Christian apologists said that those are late legendary stories, because if you read the New Testament, you nowhere... Do, yeah, what, what, you, what you have is, so if you go to like Fox's Book of Martyrs, it lists how all the, how all the apostles uh, died, lists how they, lists their deaths. Um what you can actually say is that some of those some of those cases are based on very late sources like third century yeah, yeah. and so on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Peter and Paul, not the case. That's based on that's based on early. And that's why people that's why people across the board will grant that. That's why uh, I'm assuming Bart Ehrman would would grant the martyrdoms of Peter and Paul. And that probably has something to do with why he believes they were convinced that Jesus had appeared to them. So anyway, the point of uh, some of these sources being late and Sean McDowell has a has a big book uh, on this where he goes through all those sources and sort of rates them. It's like, OK, this is a first century source. This looks good. 
This is from a guy who's in a very good position to know what happened. This on this apostle, that's a third century source. Uh, it's always po it's always possible that that this person was familiar with some tradition and it's accurate, but you just you can't put a lot of confidence uh, in it. Point is, it's kind of a it's kind of a mixture. It's kind oh, of a, it's kind of a mixture, but uh, anyway, the, the the point is, we we have a we know what the early Christians we know what the early Christians believe. The early Christians go out and they spread a church, and there's a church, and they spread Christianity. Uh, they spread Christianity in Europe, in the Middle East, across Northern Africa, and so on. We we know that these guys were proclaiming Jesus' death and resurrection. These things were always uh, foundational to Christianity, uh, and we can we can. Uh, we, we can obviously continue this. Um, I did want to address the point of Paul. You were bringing up that Paul, you quoted yeah, if uh, I can, you quoted Galatians. Yeah, if I can uh, interject, like. Uh, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, let me let me uh, let me just uh, let me go through some of these super chats real quick. Then you can yeah. respond. Then you can uh, interject to what I just said. And then we'll we'll go to uh, we'll go to the passages you brought up from Paul, just so everyone knows what we're talking about here. And uh, I'll mention why I uh, disagree with what you just said. Uh, let's see, guys, where did the name Isa come from? Syriac? Do you have any theories on that? Uh, well, Isa is, it means Jesus in, in Arabic. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, like, like the Quran, it was revealed in Arabic. So of course it's going to translate these Greek words like, uh, you know, Jesus, John, uh, Zachariah, Noah, all these Hebrew and Greek names. Of course, they're going to translate it into, into Arabic, um. I, I think that that just what people were calling Jesus in uh, sixth century Arabia, and the Quran just is using that 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 terminology. Like the New Testament is written in Greek, but we know Jesus' disciples and Jesus spoke Aramaic. So you know, if you want to argue, there's a language problem with the well, there's a language problem with the New Testament too, because the New Testament was written in Greek. Yeah, Jesus' disciples spoke in Aramaic, so you got the same problem with the with the New Testament. Well, so the the issue for people who are, who are bringing this up is that. Um, the Arabic for Jesus' Hebrew name is actually Yasu, and he's not called that; he's called Isa. And so there's a there's a, a question of where this uh, where this actually uh, where this where the name came from. So the theories are um, one that it's actually a transliteration from the Greek name, which is Iesus, Iesus, and then it goes through Syriac. And then it goes into Arabic that way. I've even seen some people maintain that this is actually an insult because Esau would be the Arabic version of Esau. And so Esau would be an insult. If, if Jews called someone Esau, that's you're the enemy of the Jews and so on. So there's a theory about that. But no, uh, at, at the, no, the, the idea is that at the end of the day, no one knows. People don't know. It's just, hey, here's this here's this name. It's Esau. If it was if it was the Arabic version of Jesus, uh, Hebrew name, then it would have been Yasu, but it's Isa. And so the question is, why, why is that? And some, there have been Muslims, there have been Muslim scholars who just said, uh, we believe that's, that's like his special, the special name from Allah for, for Jesus. Well, yeah. My personal view is I just say Jesus. I just say Noah, Abraham. I just use their biblical names. So when I'm, when I'm talking about these issues, like in my videos, I just use, I don't say Isa. Uh, Ibrahim. I don't say it. I say Abraham, mm -hmm. Jesus, John the Baptist. So I, mm -hmm. I don't have any problem mm -hmm. saying those English names. There's Muslims have problems with it. That's mm -hmm. just, that's not me. You know, yeah. I uh, use English. We have Happy Easter. I love Jesus. Uh, happy Resurrection Day. Uh, Persian in Holland. Reading on Christianity. Any books apart from the Bible you advise me to read? Kind of uh, reconsidering Islam. Thank you. So Persian in Holland, reading on Christianity. Any books apart from the Bible you advise me to read, kind of reconsidering Islam? I don't know if that means you're like considering rejecting Islam or considering it uh, le like you're going to believe it. I don't know what you're talking about there. Uh, what are your what are your recommendations, uh, Etisham? Uh, what was the question? What books you recommend? What uh, This person's uh, apparently uh, studying... Uh, studying uh, Christianity and Islam, what would you recommend? Oh, uh, anything by uh, Bart Ehrman, uh, Raymond Brown. Uh, Raymond Brown wrote uh, Introduction to the New Testament. That's a really good book. I learned a lot from it. Raymond Brown, um, Bart D. Ehrman, of course. No, I know he's an atheist. Uh, I have this Bible uh, right here. I got this book, uh, this Bible, the Archaeological Study Bible. 
it's a really good book. Um, actually, you know, you know, a Catholic priest gave me that, <laughs> gave me that Bible. And mm. I, I really like that Bible because back in the day I wasn't religious. Like, you know, like when, when I went to university, that's when I became religious, you know, like in high school, I didn't care about religion. Like I, I was collecting Spider-Man books and Batman books. I was collecting, I was like into like video games and, you know, I played some sports and, uh, I played tennis. I did not care about religion, actually. You know, like a Catholic priest actually got me back into a religion when I went to university. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting that, you know, people leave Islam and become Christians. But, you know, it's, it's actually because of Christians. But it's it was actually a Catholic priest that got me into Islam. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's kind of a it's kind of a strange thing. Yeah, I would, I would recommend uh, if you go to my uh, YouTube I have a bunch of uh, books, some book recommendations. I would avoid Ibn Asaf, you know, the history of Althabari and stuff, stuff like that. But um, yeah, anything by Raymond Brown, uh, Bart the Yearman. William Lane Craig is good at refuting atheism. I think he's really good at refuting atheism. I've been reading some stuff by Frank Turek. Do you know Frank Turek, uh, yep. David? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been reading some of his stuff. Um, he's really good at refuting atheism. I don't agree with his uh, theological views, but Frank Turek wrote a book uh what is it called why i don't have enough faith to be an atheist is mm -hmm. that the book uh, yeah is that the book david uh, yeah that's yeah that's frank yeah that's frank and uh yeah i would recommend <clears throat> those those guys um and i would recommend reading uh who's that muslim scholar uh who's that muslim scholar i was just reading dark yeah. ramadan dark ramadan yeah all right so and yeah uh persian and holland um not sure what you're kind of uh, looking towards, uh, you know, as Etisham was pointing out, if you're if you're talking about like the existence of God, you've got William Lane Craig and uh, Frank Turek there. Um, I, I would since you're studying Christianity and Islam, I would get the book Answering Islam by Norm Geisler and Abdul Salib because they actually. They're also building a case for Christianity in there. So if you wanted an idea of a Christian perspective on those issues. Um, but yeah, people can also make recommendations in the, in the chat as far as, uh, what books, um, our Persian and Holland friend would, uh, would, would, would help them out. Uh, Dustin, I, would, I would, I would avoid Robert Spencer. <laughs> not me. Well, if you want the history of jihad, Robert Spencer is awesome source. No, I, I disagree. Yeah. Uh, Dustin says you believe Jesus was, uh, saved absolute death sentence, but not a miraculous birth. He created us in his image, but can't take a form similar to his own. Uh, actually, Muslims and Christians agree on, on the miraculous birth of Jesus. So not a, not an issue of dispute. Uh, Daniel Patrick. Hey, Salam, brother Gulam. Watched Imam Mikhail Al Ribar pronounce takfir on you during today's sermon. What? You got takfir today? What is that? What? What? Why would I? Why would I get? Well, I am. I am pretty controversial. Me and Shabir Ali were pretty. We're pretty controversial, you know. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I like. I you can't please everybody, right? Like, yeah. there's, there's, there. That's pretty harsh. He's takfiring you, man. No, nah, I don't. I don't know why. I mean, I'm. <laughs> I'm Muslim, I'm Sunni Muslim. You know, I, I don't just because I don't I don't agree with certain things that that people say. That doesn't mean I'm a I'm a bad like me and Adnan Rashid. Uh, you know, Adnan Rashid like we we don't we have our disagreements. Like Adnan Rashid believes in the uh, substitution theory. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't I don't agree with him. Um, but we you know we get along. Me and Adnan Rashid we get we get along. I, I I've known him for like for a while. Me and Ijaz we get along. I, there's, I don't know any Muslim, why would Muslim follow just have any kind of, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't get along with every Muslim apologist, but I, I try to, I try to be friendly with everybody. I, I well, it's know. too late now because you've been tack feared by that guy. I don't know who that is, but. Uh, yeah, well, I'm going to fear you back. <laughs> In your face. Uh uh, Hussein Mashni here. Uh, David, don't forget about Stephen's death in Acts. Yeah, in the book of Acts, you have Stephen's death. And then you have uh, James is also uh, executed in Acts. So anyway. Yeah, but, yeah, but it doesn't, Acts doesn't say why they were martyred or what they believed when they were martyred. You know, I, I read I read the book of Acts. It just says they were martyred. It doesn't say they believed in Jesus' death when they were martyred and stuff like that. So it doesn't it's like the New Testament. You think, does not you think the book of Acts is not clear on them believing that Jesus died by crucifixion? Because they only say no, it like 487 no. million times. 
No, no, like Stephen, the the book of the the only martyrdom in the New Testament is Stephen. But Stephen, like, we don't know what he why he was killed. Like, he, he wasn't killed for his belief that Jesus died on the cross. He absolutely um, was. He gives a he gives a full he gives a full sermon, and they flip out and uh and and stone him for it. Yeah, but that just Stephen. What about Peter? What about like nowhere in the New Testament does it say Peter, you know, was crucified upside down. Uh, you know, Thomas was martyred in India. These come from later legendary uh yeah sources. again again some of the some of our sources uh, some of our sources are first century source like here's here's what i don't get if you have you've got the you've got the gospels and you've got the letters and suppose you want to be skeptical about them and say ah we don't know who wrote these guys we can't trust these guys okay you have the next generation who knew these guys and they're saying what they believe and we're gonna ah we can't trust these guys and what that really means is we're just not going to trust anyone who disagrees with what we believe that's that methodology is completely open to people, but I mean, be consistent. If we want to apply that methodology, I could say, well, I don't, I don't, I have no idea what Muhammad believed. I have no idea what Muhammad believed because, uh, you know, our earliest source on our earliest biographical source is Ibn Asak, which you said you don't trust. That's that's more than a century later. So where are we going? We go into Bukhari. That's two centuries later. This would be like us quoting century, quoting. So we just agreed that if you have a third century source on someone being martyred that we probably would be pretty skeptical about that. That's the situation we're in with uh, with uh, with the best sources on the life of Muhammad. So if we're going to be consistent, we if you want to say, hey, you can't trust the first century sources, whether they're in the New Testament or outside the New Testament, you just have to get rid of all these and you can't trust the second century sources and the third century sources. Fine. We could be that skeptical. But we should be consistent and be that skeptical of everything. And that's exactly what Mohammed Sven Kalish, he was a, a Muslim convert who became a, a Muslim scholar in Germany. And he just said, hey, these methods that I've been using dealing with the Old Testament and the New Testament, I'm going to apply these same methods to the Muslim sources now. And he concluded that Muhammad never probably never existed. I disagree with him. I disagree with him on that because I'm not I'm not dialing up my skepticism like that. But if that's how we're this that's how we're gonna do it, we're just gonna say, ah, we can't trust these first century sources, we can't trust the second century sources, third century sources, we can't trust any of the sources, we can't trust uh we can't trust Paul, we can't trust uh Paul's interactions with other people, we can't trust the next generation who knew these guys, we can't trust any of these guys to to explain what they believed. We can't trust modern scholars, not even we can't trust the atheist scholars where they're pointing these things out. We can't trust anyone. All right, then. Then then we just, I don't know. It seems like we just can't know history. Yeah, I mean, just commenting on Islamic history, I would just recommend this book, uh, Studies in Hadith Methodology and Literature by Mustafa al-Azami. He talks about how there were earlier biographies than Ibn Asak, earlier Hadith than Bukhari, and Ibn Asak and Bukhari incorporated a lot of that earlier material. So the disciples of the Prophet Muhammad wrote down Hadith, and those were passed down from generation to generation. And Ibn Asak survived and Bukhari survived, but those earlier material that Abu Bakr, Umar, Qadab, Ali wrote those hadith and those biographies that Ibn Abbas, they didn't survive. They were incorporated into Ibn Asak and Sayyid Bukhari. But we're not talking about Islamic uh, preservation stuff, but I would just recommend this book, Studies in uh, uh, Hadith Methodology and Literature. But getting back to, you know, the... Um, the New Testament and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I do agree that there is some truth in the New Testament. I'm not saying that it's all fictional and, and, and stuff like that. I'm just saying that this claim that the disciples believed it stems from the New Testament. And the New Testament, like I said, has been proven not to be historically accurate, according to even Christian scholars. They're even saying Raymond Brown, mm, Michael Cole. No, they, no, the position would be that uh, scholars would reject things that they have a reason to reject. But no one, no one says, well, you just can't trust anything in this book. It's just uh, it's uh, it just can't be trusted. That's a that's a pretty fringe position. If you ask Bart Ehrman where you learn about Jesus, he says you go to the New Testament. That's what he says. That's where you go. Now, he'll be skeptical. He's not going to believe a source that says he's not going to believe a source that says Jesus walked on water. He's going to be skeptical, especially about things like miracle claims. Uh, he's he's going to uh, he's going to agree with you that people are, are making things up. But historians actually have methods for getting to even if they're skeptical of books. Right. Like I'm I'm skeptical of a lot of Muslim source. I believe you can actually get to true information, true information using the tools of a historian. So they look and they say, OK, what's the, what's the earliest source here? Uh, do we have multiple 
uh, multiple testimony. In other words, is it just is it just one source? If so, then it could be one guy made it up. If you have several sources, then okay, how did this get into several sources? And so then they start looking for independent sources. Like, uh, is it just is it five people, but they're all quoting the same person? In which case, it's it's actually goes back to one person. Or are they five separate independent sources? In which case, you've got a pretty you've got a pretty good case. So they'll look at all these sources, and when they they don't look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as these sources, they they think of it in terms of like we we were talking about with Q. So they'll have Mark. They'll treat Mark as a source. Uh, anything that's in Matthew and Luke, but not in Mark, they call that Q. Those are sayings. And so you've got Mark as a source, you've got Q as a source. Uh, then there's material in Matthew, but that isn't in the other Gospels, and they call that M. And then there's material that's in Luke that isn't anywhere else, and they call that L. And then they look at John, and then they've got Paul. And so they look at all of these, and these are independent sources. And so when you have something that's in Mark and it's in John and we find it in Paul or something like that, you, if you have these, uh, if you have information that occurs in all of this, the question is, how did it get in all these independent separate sources? And just saying, well, so-and-so says that the, this gospel is anonymous doesn't really account for how this became just completely dominant, uh, a dominant position in yeah, early I, Christianity. Yeah, but- if I can comment on that, I think Paul's view shaped the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, not the <clears> disciples. <throat> because if you read Paul, the letters of Paul in 2 Corinthians 11, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4 to 5, Paul says that he got into fights with the disciples, and the disciples were teaching a different Jesus. The, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4 to 5, that there were people preaching a different Jesus than what Paul was preaching. What was the Jesus Paul was preaching? Jesus, uh, the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. So Paul is saying they're people, they're disciples, people preaching a different Jesus than what he's preaching, and that's the disciples or the disciples of the disciples. So, this so the disciples. That, so you're claiming that 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 Paul was preaching a different Jesus from uh, from Peter and the apostles, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I think. Two Corinthians chapter eleven verse forty five is saying. Hey, I let, mean, we can have our disagreements, but that. That's yeah, let's just go back because you you cited you cited a couple sources. So you cited. Um, you cited Galatians. You and cited, I know— You cited yeah, Galatians, I, uh, you said chapter 1, 11, and 12 there? Yeah, and I know I know you don't—I know you don't like Richard Carrier, but I think Richard Carrier has a good point, because he says— well, The Paul, atheist? The atheist Richard Carrier? Yeah, the atheist Richard Carrier. I'm, I'm friends with him, and he had a good point. He said, well, Paul's view probably shaped the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the rest of the New Testament documents. Well, Paul's well, view let, of— uh, Let's look at what Paul—let's look at what Paul actually says here. So this— decided. This is Galatians 1. He says, I want you to, so this is what you cited. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. The gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And so the claim here is that Paul is just getting this information from his own head or from his own revelations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if we keep reading, so he gives a little bit of a story. Matter of fact, let's just read it. So everyone knows Paul's pretty, pretty, pretty quick read here. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, My immediate response was not to consult any human being. So I didn't instantly go up and uh, consult human beings. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, that's Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. So... Paul went and stayed with Peter for 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. So he saw Peter and James, the Lord's brother. He says, I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. All right, then that instantly continues. This is just relevant just for uh, what Paul is, is saying here. 
Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation, so he's still getting revelations, and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God shows no favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, that's Peter, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do all along. So, uh, Etoshem, what I'm pointing out there is, you go to Galatians 1, and you quote Paul saying, hey, I didn't get the, I didn't get the gospel uh, from, from other people. I got it from Revelation. But notice what he does. Uh, after a while, he goes up and sees Peter and James. And then after another 14 years, he goes up and sees Peter, James, and John. And he says, he says that there were, there were people who were preaching a false gospel. So he goes up and he says that he presented what he's preaching. So he gets a gospel by revelation. He gets, he, gets, he gets revelations. And in this case, it's about, you know, it's about uh, Gentiles not needing to be circumcised and so on. But he goes up to them and preaches to them the God, whatever revelations he'd had. And he says that it was to see if he'd been running his, his race in vain. In other words, Paul is willing to go up to the apostles, to Peter, James, and John, and say to them, guys, this is what I got by revelation. But Paul is also a person who believes that Satan can masquerade as an angel of light. So for Paul, hey, if I have a if I have a way that I can that I can test my revelations, I'm going to go test my revelations. So in other words, this would be like me if I get a revelation from if I believe I got a revelation and it tells me that uh, you know it tells me about something that I can go investigate. Well, it kind of makes sense to go and investigate it because then I can see if it's actually a correct revelation. But Paul says he did this. He says that there were there were there were people preaching uh, a false message. So he goes up to Peter and James and John says he laid down, he laid out what he's been teaching and they give him the right hand of fellowship. So it's, it's Paul. He tests his revelations by asking Peter and James and John, Hey, is, is this right? And they say, absolutely go, go preach that to the Gentiles. We'll focus, we'll focus on the Jews. You focus on the Gentiles. There were other people who were preaching something else. So I'm just pointing this out because when you go to Corinthians or something like that, and you see that Paul's talking about false apostles and so on, uh, he's not talking about Peter and James and John. He's talking about these other guys that were also, that people who were also rejected by Peter and James and John. Point being, to say that Paul is just making this up and you're saying, hey, Paul's getting this from his own head or something like this, his own private revelations, and that he can be out, you know, he's, he could just be out in left field and maybe nothing he's saying is actually true. Paul himself says, I went up and tested it because I needed to know if these guys are going to agree with me. And he says they did agree with me. So you're quoting Galatians to show that Paul's just coming up with this himself. And Paul himself says, actually, Paul, I mean, actually, Peter and James and John are in agreement with me. Well, I, I, I disagree. Yeah, I, I disagree because notice what Paul says in uh, Galatians 1, 11 to 12. He says, I did not receive it by human uh, by human origin. So what does that mean? It means that he's not getting his he's not getting his gospel from the disciples, Peter, James, John, etc. He's getting it from Revelation. So Paul, I strongly believe that Paul made up Jesus' death and resurrection and that 
view filtered into uh, that colored the or uh, influenced the later New Testament documents because Paul says in one Corinthians fifteen uh, one to uh, one to or three to five he says for what I received I passed on to you through the most important that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now notice what Paul is saying. He's saying he's getting that information from the Old Testament. But mm -hmm. the hilarious thing is when you read the Old Testament, it's not talking about any, you know, crucified or dying Messiah. I know I saw your video before. We went on about uh, 10 reasons why Jesus died. You talk about Isaiah 53, but Jews, the you know, even Christian commentators, honest Christian commentators are saying it's talking about the nation of Israel. So Isaiah 53 mm, no. is talking about Israel. It doesn't so make Paul, it doesn't make any sense. The person, whoever it is, is referred to as he, and he dies for the he dies for the nation of Israel. So how is Israel dying for the nation of Israel as a substitute for the nation of Israel? Well, do you respect Jewish commentators and rabbis? When I know, they come I, I, know I, I know there are Jewish commentators who say that refers to the nation of Israel, but you have yeah, to yeah. do that if you don't. You, if you don't want to believe that some person died, which is what it sounds like, if you don't want to believe that some person died, you have to say it's talking about something else. And you do have that the that the nation of Israel is called a servant, so you have some basis for saying the servant is the nation of Israel, but this servant also. You're saying the nation of Israel died for the people of Israel. That that makes no sense. It just doesn't make any sense. Which is why, which is why it's just a it's just a, an uncomfortable passage uh, for lots of Jews. In fact, my, my friend Anthony Rogers, he has uh, he has Jewish in laws, and he read Isaiah 53 to them one day, and the response was, "Hey, quit reading the New Testament to us." He's like, "Wait, that's not the, that's not the New Testament. That's the that's the Old Testament." Isn't he Italian or something? Oh, he has Jewish uh, in-laws. Well, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 his in-laws. Uh, so anyway, but no, no, I, I think yeah. it, I think you missed the point of what I was saying about Paul. So Paul has, Paul gets a, a an appearance of Jesus on the road to Damascus. So he believes that Jesus appeared to them. He believes that he gets revelations from Jesus periodically. And so you point out, hey, Paul says, hey, I didn't get this from someone. That's true. He didn't get he didn't get that that initial appearance from Jesus by by hearing by hearing it from someone. But he says in the same book you cited, Galatians, he says he went up and met with Peter and James at the first meeting. Then 14 years later, so he's going around preaching. Then he says he went up again and I laid out the gospel that I've been preaching to see if I've been running in vain, meaning I'm going to the actual apostles of Jesus. I'm going to Jesus' original disciples, and I'm asking them, is what I am saying correct? So Paul does go to confirm that message, and they confirm it. They say, yes. So it isn't just Paul saying, hey, I got these revelations, and I, I, could, just run, I could just run around the world with these revelations. As Paul said, hey, I received these revelations, and then I went and verified them with the original guys. And so what does that mean? If Paul has his revelations, and Paul is out preaching the gospel that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. And then he says, I'm going up to Jerusalem to meet with the original apostles to make sure, to make sure that I haven't been led astray with uh, any revelations. And they extend the right hand of fellowship and they say, absolutely, go preach this among the Gentiles. That's the original apostles confirming the message of the apostle Paul that you said Paul's just coming up with this himself. If Paul just came up with, with a message himself and then he goes up to the apostles, they would have said, who is this guy? Get rid of him. Yeah, but if you, I think you're, I disagree. I would disagree with you, David. Respectfully, I disagree because if you read uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16, it says- Wait, I thought, who, who's, who, who wrote 2 Peter? It's anonymous, even according to Christian scholars. Okay, so why are, you, why are you citing it? Paul's not anonymous. No, I'm just saying that. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me finish my point. Okay. Two Peter one verse sixteen says, "We did not follow cleverly devised myths. We are uh -huh. eyewitness to history." And so this was writing unknown Christians who were saying that Paul's version of Jesus was a myth. Whoa, 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 whoa! Wait, yeah. where does he mention Paul there, or Paul's version of Christianity, or the res yeah. or the or the resurrection, or is, or Jesus? They just say, "Hey, we were." Oh my goodness. They, yeah, no, no, let, let me finish my point. I can pull it up. Number 16, uh, you know, the, the Christians are saying that Paul's gospel is cleverly devised myth. So there are Christians saying that Paul's gospel is a myth. So Paul's the one. Where, I, where is he? Where is he talking about Paul there? He's not talking. I'm just saying that's Paul's version 
beat out the disciples version of Jesus. And there and there were Christians who were saying that it's a myth. Paul's gospel is a myth. Two Peter. Is, is, that, is that what they're saying? Yeah. That's what they're saying, that we did not follow cleverly devised myths. All right. Uh, All right. We're going to take a look at this. We're going to take a look at this. Let me just pull these passages up. All right. So let's see what Peter, let's see what Peter says. Or, or if you want to say anonymous, whatever. Uh, it's not anonymous. It identifies himself as, as, uh, as Simon Peter. If you want to say that's a... Uh, that's fake. Uh, that's interesting because I had no, I have no idea why you would be quoting it. But let's go ahead, take a peek here. No, my point is. What did you say? Verse sixteen. Uh, <clears throat> two Peter chapter one verse sixteen. We did not follow. Okay. The box. Now let's see here, everyone, everyone in the chat, everyone in the chat. Let's see if you read this as you can't trust the apostle Paul and what he's talking about with Jesus. And we're we're contradicting that. What Paul's version is just cleverly devised uh, fables or stories. Let's read what it actually says here. So, Second Peter one verse sixteen: For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the when we told you about what the res, the resurrection or what? No, when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But we were eyewitnesses of His Majesty. So what's it talking about when it refers to his majesty? He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my son, son of the Father, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. When he says we weren't following cleverly devised stories, he's saying, hey, we didn't just hear a bunch of stuff. We didn't hear a bunch of stuff and then just pass it on and believe it. We're the eyewitnesses here. And what's he even talking about? He's talking about seeing Jesus at his transfiguration. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased and identifying him as the son. Where are you getting that he's responding to Paul here? When he's clearly, he's clearly responding to people, hey, what do you believe in Jesus, man? You just believe a bunch of nonsense. He's saying, what are you talking about? We were there. We saw we saw him glorified. We saw when the father uh, said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. No, notice what 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16 says. We did not follow cleverly devised myths. That means there were Christians, first generation or second generation, saying that, no. Whoa, 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 whoa. Why, why would why would you why would you say this is Christians saying cleverly devised stories and not critics? If you walk out in the Roman Empire and you're preaching and you say, "Hey, everyone, you need to believe in Jesus," and someone, "Hey, I'm not believing those old fairy tales," and his response is, "I didn't follow. These aren't stories. These aren't fairy tales. We're eyewitnesses of this. We're the ones who have actually seen him." What in the name of common sense are you talking about? Yeah. Wait. Hang on. Did I? Yeah. I mean that. That's what. That's. That's what I, that's what I get is that there were clever devised myths. That means there were Christians or Christians or disciples of the disciples saying that Paul's gospel is seen as a myth. Two Peter chapter two verse one, and uh, you know they're trying to strike back at at those Christians. So there were Christians. My point is why that, why I, I I'm just I want I just want to be I'm, I'm trying to understand where you're getting this from. Where are you getting the idea? Because it, I mean, think if I were, if I'm preaching, or if you're preaching, if you're preaching Islam. It would be very common for an atheist to say, come on, just believing a bunch of nonsense stories from 14 centuries ago, or Christian, you're just believing his nonsense stories from 2000 years ago, grow up. And then, so the apostles are going out preaching and then people are saying, hey, this is just a bunch of, this is just a bunch of fables. And the response here is, what are you talking about? These aren't, these aren't stories. These aren't stories about well, Jesus. Clarify. We were eyewitnesses. Like let me clarify my point. If you read, uh, let's let's go back to two Corinthians chapter eleven, verse four to five. Paul oh, one, says one disciples. One more, one more. Yeah, before we before we go back there, I just wanted to continue. Uh, I just wanted to um, just one more slight issue. Just two chapters later, same exact book, same exact book. Let's start at verse fifteen. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. 
His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. So this is the same book you brought out, that you brought up. You cited this. You said, hey, we don't know who wrote it, but we're going to trust them to say that this book is attacking the Apostle Paul and saying you can't trust Paul. Paul is the one who's preaching these fables, and the exact same book that you brought up, that you cited, calls him our dear brother Paul, and then says that some people distort what he says as they do the other scriptures. So it calls Paul's writings scripture. So Paul's writings are on the level of scripture, and Paul is our dear brother, and yet you're somehow reading chapter one as the author condemning Paul's view of Jesus and the death and resurrection of Jesus. So how how are you getting that from this? Well, it's well, it goes back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4 to 5. Paul says there were other disciples or disciples of the disciples preaching a different Jesus than Peter. So two Peter came afterwards, right? So so when they say cleverly devised myths, there are Christians who don't believe in Paul, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So Paul, so the author of 2 Peter is trying to strike back, saying, we did not follow cleverly devised myths. So people are already saying that Paul's gospel, Paul's, Paul's version of Jesus was seen as a myth, because according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4 to 5, there were disciples preaching, there were people preaching a different Jesus than what Paul was preaching, and the only people who were preaching Jesus were the disciples or the disciples of the disciples. So you got a problem with uh, with 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4 to 5, if you're saying Paul's gospel lined up with the disciples. No, that's not what Paul says. And that's not what 2 Peter that's is. It, that's exactly what Paul, and by the way, th this goes back to what we were reading from Galatians. Paul goes up to confirm his revelations with the apostles because there were other, there were other people in that early community who were saying that Paul is wrong. So Paul acknowledges that people were attacking his view of Jesus. He says the apostles, the actual apostles of Jesus, they confirmed his message. But Etesham, this wasn't this wasn't a disagreement. We know exactly what this is about because it, we have it all laid out. We have it all laid out. We have it in, in Paul's letters, and we have this in the book of Acts. You well, had I mean, you, no. I'm just saying we know what this dispute was about. This dispute is not about whether Jesus died on the cross. The dispute is not about whether Jesus rose from the dead. The dispute, well, I, the dispute in I, the I, first I, century that was among that was among people who believed in Christ. These are people who believed in Jesus, and you're right. Some of the people who believed in Jesus rejected Paul. We know what this is based on. You had an early the, the early group. They're called the Judaizers. It's basically if you if you Etesham wanted to become a Christian. They say you have to become a Jew first. You have to become a Jew and then convert to Christianity. So you you are bound by the Old Testament law. So the first step is people have to get people have to get circumcised. They have to become Jews, and then they they can also they also believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Paul's rejecting that, saying you don't have to you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to be you don't have to be a Jew. And we find the exact same thing in the Book of Acts that we find uh, in Paul's letters, which is the apostles examined all this, and they said, you know what, that's right. The the Gentile believers do not need to become Jews and uh, adhere to the Old Testament law. This the even the Reve even the Old Testament revelations when when they're being revealed when the Torah is coming. This is for the children of Israel, the children of Israel, the children of Israel. These are the revelations for the children of Israel. So these revelations was were part of a specific covenant. There were people in the first century who said, oh. If you're a Gentile and you want to get on board with Jesus, you have to also become part. You have to enter into that covenant that was for the children of Israel. You have to be a part of that covenant, too. And then you can believe in Jesus. Paul says, no, that's a different covenant. Jesus is saying he brought a new covenant because there's a new covenant. You just enter into the new covenant. Why are you going, with the, why are you going back to the old covenant to join the new? It doesn't make any sense. That's the dispute between Paul and and these these other these other preachers but guess what the apostles peter james john they're on paul's side in all of this they agree with paul and that's why and that's why this wins out no no i i disagree i respectfully disagree i think because if you read galatians 1 chapter 1 verse 6 it says there are people preaching a different gospel so the disciples. Yes. Who, who believe, okay. Who believed in Jesus? The have you have you have you have you read Galatians? The the entire the book explains itself. He's going off I, on people saying I, that you have to be circumcised I to read, believe in Jesus. I read the entire Bible twice. I read it twice. Okay. Then you so, know. Then you know what Galatians is about. 
Yeah, but I'm saying there are people saying that there's a different gospel. Galatians chapter one verse six it says a different gospel. So what is who is preaching the gospel? The disciples, right? So Paul is saying these aren't minor doctrinal disputes. He's saying he's having, he's saying people are preaching a different no, gospel. No, dude, what, what th these were not these were not minor. This was this was. I mean, like like ripping doing? like ripping the church like ripping the church in in into into different factions over the issue of whether. Gentiles actually have to obey the commands of the Mosaic covenant. That was a huge, that was a huge, that was a huge issue. That was not a minor doctrinal issue. In fact, explain, in fact, even how you, what? Go ahead. How do you explain Galatians chapter one, verse six? There's read Galatians, my goodness, read Galatians. The entire thing is guys, you don't have to be circumcised. In fact, Paul, Paul, Paul even goes off in Galatians. He says, I wish those people who are pestering you would go ahead and cut themselves, go ahead and castrate themselves. He's saying, hey, if these guys who are talking to you, if these guys who are preaching to you, if they're preaching this other gospel to you, yeah, say, exactly. and he's, he, identif he identifies it. He says, if they're saying they have to be, if they're, they're saying you have to be circumcised. So they're saying, this is not, oh, and by the way, they're saying Jesus didn't die by crucifixion. No one's saying that. They're saying you have to obey the old, the, you have to obey the commands of the Mosaic Covenant. That's the entire, that's what the entire book of Galatians is about. So why does Paul say my gospel and one Timothy and all that stuff? When he says my gospel, that's his God. That's not the disciples gospel. It's his gospel. One Timothy, et cetera. So Paul says my gospel. That means it's his gospel, not the disciples gospel. And you, again, you have the problem with two Corinthians chapter 11, verse four to five. People are preaching a different Jesus. Now, we they, can, were. We, they were, they were. There's a, there's a G, there's a Jesus where you have to, where you have to enter into the Mosaic covenant to be accepted by him. And Paul, no, that, that, Paul's saying that's not Jesus. Paul's Jesus is uh, the crucified and resurrected Jesus, and people are saying people are preaching a different Jesus. A, a, a Jesus, the, a Jesus who wasn't crucified and didn't rise from the dead. Show us that Jesus, anyway. No, it's the Q God. That's what I'm saying. If we go back to the Q God, there's nothing about Q. There's nothing in Q about Jesus not dying and not rising from the dead. Well, Daniel A. Smith will disagree with you in his book. Uh, Dan Smith, Dan, Daniel Smith believes that Jesus definitely died. Yeah, because I don't know what his theological views are. Maybe he's an atheist. Maybe he's a Christian. I don't know. But uh, Dieter Ziller, again, if we were to yeah, let's, take Shabir, let, let's see that. that. That's what I'm. That's what I mean. I'm not. I'm not taking Shabir's word for an obscure German scholar. That uh, that and 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 I mean, keep in mind, Shabir's saying, "Hey, an obscure German scholar that you've never uh, heard of before, and that uh, that uh, I can't produce right now." He says this, and we're all just supposed to accept it. Like Shabir, no, I, Shabir. One, show it. Show us who this guy is. Two, show us what the argument is. And three, let's see if the argument is actually good. Because this think, this guy is so far out in, in left field. Uh, uh, if if he says what Shabir says that he said, this guy's so far out in left field that we are seriously going to have to see if this guy has a good argument. I, I don't even know what the guy's argument is. All I know is Shabir says that the guy said something. That's not evidence. I think I know what his argument is, because if you read the Old Testament, you know, uh, Elijah went up to heaven alive, uh, Enoch. So he's basing it on the uh, figures of Elijah and Enoch, because those if you read the Old Testament, those figures went to heaven without uh, dying. So I think that's where in, if you talk about the sign of Jonah, according to the Q gospel, I nothing about the three days, three nights thing. The Q gospels talk about the sign of Jonah. That, as that does that does not sound like any German uh, scholar. So, like, that does not sound like an argument. That what you're saying sounds like an argument that a Muslim apologist would use, not a not a not a, not a German scholar. So again, it's it's just it, this goes back to Shabir. Shabir, if you're putting this down as evidence, tell us what the guy's actual argument is. I would love to see it because just saying, hey, some German guy. Guess what? I can find a German guy who says who says anything. I, I mentioned Mohammed Sven Kalish. He was a convert to convert to Judaism. I mean, a convert to Islam. Became a Muslim scholar. Germans Germany's first Muslim scholar. And he concluded that Muhammad didn't exist. Guess what? I can't simply say, well, this guy says Muhammad never existed. And therefore, you see, a German scholar says that Muhammad never existed. That's not, that's not evidence. That's not evidence. You'd have to say, what are his reasons? Do we accept those reasons? And as far as, yeah, what, I, as, far as what his reasons were, I reject it. I, I, I'm not going to say, well, he's a German, therefore he's right. You definitely don't want to say someone's right just because they're a German. That would lead to some pretty disturbing uh, 
global <laughs> global catastrophes. No, well, I think I think I know where he's getting it from from the, or his reading of the Old Testament. Elijah and Enoch are taken alive, so that's that's where that's where he's coming from. That that's where he's basing it mm. off. Of. We'd so, ha- we'd have to see it, but that would that would make no sense. So God took certain people alive, therefore yeah, I, therefore I, 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 other people who died were were actually taken alive. You could say that you could say that about anything. So that if that if that would if that would be his argument, I would regard that argument as completely ridiculous which is why i have i have more respect for even an unknown german scholar that i've never heard from apart from shabir ali uh to think that he's he's probably got some some better argument but i'm guessing it's completely unpersuasive otherwise you'd find the argument from someone else besides some obscure german scholar that no one's ever heard of no no i mean i i I disagree i disagree with what you're saying but that just me but, uh, you know, you, you still have the problem with the empty tomb. Nobody sees Jesus rise from the dead. So that explains the empty tomb, because if God took Jesus from the tomb into heaven, that explains the empty tomb. Right. So I believe that, that would that would explain it. Yes. Yes. So, just, yeah. Matter of fact, let me let me say let me say where I what you what your view would actually uh, account for. So if Jesus. So you have you have the you have the obvious problem. If a if a, a standard if. If a standard Muslim, a regular Muslim, says Jesus was never crucified, this by itself doesn't account for how there was how people concluded that Jesus was crucified. So that's why they would need to say, you know, yep. God, God disguised someone. So that that would raise issues. You wouldn't have that issue. So if Jesus is the one who's nailed to a cross, that accounts for why it was understood that Jesus was crucified. If Jesus survived the crucifixion. So if he survived, in other words, if he, uh, you know, he passes out, they think he's dead, they take him down from the cross, stick him in the tomb, and then God takes him up from there. You see, ordinary, uh, classic swoon theory was meant to explain how the disciples concluded that Jesus had been raised from the dead. So the classic, not the, uh, you, you have a modified view where it's actually it's actually theistic. There's something miraculous involved here. The uh, the the classic swoon theory was just, you know, Jesus passes out on the cross. They take him down from the cross. They stick him in a tomb. And then he wakes up later. And after he wakes up, the disciples, oh, wow, he rose from the dead. This is a this is a miracle that has problems, which your view doesn't have. So so non-theistic swoon theory has the problem that. If you saw a mangled crucifixion victim uh, hobbling, you wouldn't have been able to walk, uh, just crawling out of the tomb. You wouldn't have said, oh, wow, he's been resurrected. You wouldn't you wouldn't conclude that Um, if you say that Jesus was put in the tomb and then God took him from there. That would. Yes, that would explain why people were convinced that Jesus uh, was crucified. They're familiar with crucifixion. So that would explain why they believed that he died by crucifixion, and your view, theist, which we could call theistic swoon theory, would account for why the tomb was empty. And so, yes, you can explain. You can explain everything. Uh, you can explain everything like this. But the so the real issue there is a theological one, namely, well, there are two issues. There is one how people came to believe that he'd been resurrected. If his body just disappeared, they wouldn't have concluded resurrected. Um, you wouldn't conclude resurrection without without believing that someone had physically been raised from the dead. Uh, but then the other issue is just theological, that if if Allah does this and he knows that that generations of Christians are going to conclude that Jesus had uh, been raised from the dead and uh, that everyone of every of almost every background except for Islam is going to conclude that he died on the cross. Then it's like, wait, Allah's doing something. It's miraculous. He's doing something miraculous. And Almost everyone down through history is going to completely misunderstand it, including the vast majority of Muslims who adhere to substitution theory. So it's this weird situation where you and Shabir Ali and a few others are apparently the only people who understood what Allah was doing in all of history. And that's just that that's weird to me. But go go ahead. No, no, yeah. I mean, I mean, I I understand. Look, I, I, I get why you want to hold on to Jesus' death. In resurrection, as a theist, I, I understand why you, Mike Lacona, William Lane Craig, want to hold on to Jesus' death. I get it, but there's nothing in the New Testament. Raymond Brown points out there's nothing that 
killed Jesus on the cross. If you read Raymond Brown's book, uh, Death of the Messiah, the two-volume book, he says crucifixion pierced no vital organ. So it's very positive. According to Christian scholars themselves, they're admitting that the nothing killed Jesus on the cross. Because if I'm crucified and you know for six hours or nine hours, I'm going to survive. There's no way I'm going to die. Right. You don't have to be Superman. To, you can you can you die. Know, you could die from the beating. I mean, you could die from just the beating and you could die but at any Jesus point during survived, crucifixion. Jesus survived the beating before the crucifixion. He, mm -hmm. he survived. Well, so people have survived far worse. I read a story about a Chinese man who was uh, in World War Two. They shot him with bullets and he was still like they shot like money bullets on his bag. He was still alive. So people survived far worse than ancient uh, in history. Yeah. But anyway, and some and some people and some people die just from, you know, Slashing your wrist doesn't uh, pierce any vital organs. You still die from it, from blood loss. And if you go through the scourging and the actual crucifixion, keep in mind, you just have to you just have to get the right vein or the right artery in this entire process. And you're going to bleed out pretty quickly. You can do that by one little one little nick in the right yeah. spot. We, we theists, but like as a Muslim, I believe in the supernatural. My view is that Jesus was crucified. He was taken down from the cross, put in the tomb, and Allah raised, or God raised Jesus from the tomb into heaven. Then the disciples had visions of Jesus, as Mark uh, chapter 16, verse 2 allows. Um, you know, Jesus came back in a different form. That I means Jesus came back as a vision. Uh, God, Allah, allowed Jesus' disciples to see kind of vision of Jesus. That explains why Jesus appeared to them after the crucifixion. So if Paul is making up the resurrection, like we don't know what the disciples believe. I'm still going to hold on to that view. Now, I understand where you're coming from, David, that you want Christianity to be true. You and Michael Cohen and William Lane Craig, I understand where you're coming from. It's a theological view that Jesus died for your sins, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm saying as a Muslim, as a, the as a theologian myself, I don't believe uh, that Jesus was talking about his death and resurrection as salvation. As Bart Ehrman points out in his interview, I saw that interview, he says that Jesus in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John does not say, believe in my death and resurrection for your salvation. Jesus says, repent because the gospel, because the kingdom of God is at hand. You need to repent and believe and prepare for God's kingdom. And his interview with you, David, back in 2022 or whatever, whenever you did it. So I think Ehrman has a good point that there's no theological view for Jesus' resurrection, other than what Paul was preaching. Paul, what do you mean? What, what, I'm, I'm trying to understand what you're saying, because uh, Jesus says that even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So he's giving his life as a ransom for many. So how is that not well, him how tying how his how death how to, to how something how else? How come Ehrman didn't agree with you? He says that, you know, in your interview, I, I'm pretty sure you remember that. He says, uh, Jesus says, I will not... I don't believe in my death and resurrection for your salvation. Say, Jesus says, repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. If you read the you, gospel, you were, Mark, you were saying you were saying you don't see Jesus uh, Jesus doing this. I'm saying you do, and you you have it right there in the Gospel of Mark. If Bart Ehrman wants to reject that or say that it's made up later or something, that's fine. But you do find I'm, my only point is you do find this in the Gospels. So you find it in Paul. You find it in the Gospels. You find it in the various letters, and you find it in the writings of the second generation. It's just. I mean, given given this given this theory that Paul comes in there, that Paul comes in there and just wreaks havoc and completely changes the message. I mean, just just I just want to explain how this this really doesn't make sense to me. So you've got the original followers of Jesus. So Jesus has a, a community of, of followers and so on. You've got those guys. Then you've got Paul, and he's originally on he's a Pharisee, Phar Pharisaic, Pharisaic uh, uh, Jew. And he's against Christianity because he regards it as heretical. So the question is going to be, if this isn't Jesus and he's not, if, if what the apostles are preaching is not Jesus is Lord, and it's not he died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead. I don't even know at this point what Paul's going to be outraged about with these guys. But he's outraged at something we have no idea what it was. If, if your theory is correct, we have no idea what these guys were preaching. Just Paul was really, really mad about it. But then Paul, Paul has an encounter with Jesus. Paul has an encounter and he receives revelations. He preaches. He preaches. Uh, according to Galatians, he also went up and confirmed it with the apostles. We'll just leave that to the side. But the general gist here, when Paul starts preaching Jesus, when Paul starts preaching Jesus, his, uh, his fellow Jews are really upset with him now. Now they're upset at the apostle Paul. They're upset at the apostle Paul. So here's, here's the main issue. If Paul is not on the same page as the original, as the early Christian church, as the original Christians, 
Paul isn't on the same page with them. And they're, he's preaching something radically different, completely different Jesus. And the Jews are mad at him. Then basically, you've got the Jewish community. They can't stand the Apostle Paul because he's preaching Jesus is Lord and Jesus is the Messiah and Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. So they wouldn't have been able to stand. They, they, could, they wouldn't have been able to, to take that. And, but neither would Jesus' followers. If Paul's going out and preaching some different Jesus, then the, then the original followers of Jesus wouldn't have, been, wouldn't have liked that. The Romans wouldn't have liked that. The, Paul's proclaiming Jesus as Lord and King. So this would have been Paul by himself, and everyone would have disagreed with him. Everyone. Yeah, the, Jews would, the Jews would have disagreed with him. Jesus' followers would have disagreed with him. The Romans would have disagreed with him. Everyone would have disagreed with Paul. And what you're I, saying, what you're saying is that the Apostle Paul, completely on his own, in no man's land, just convinced the entire world to adopt the to adopt uh, the message that is now known as Christianity. That is the most, I mean, in a weird way, in a weird way, you're saying Paul is the most epic, epic communicator of all time. He could literally have the all the forces that existed in his time completely against him and still win. I mean, oh, yeah. that's, let, that's let, some dude. Let me, respond, let me respond to that. Like, well, first of all, you know, as a theologian and as a historian, you know that history is written by the victors. Right. Like Alexander the Great was a conqueror and your books written about him. And, you know, because he was successful, Al Alexander's great was successful in conquering, etc. So, you know, David, that history is written by the victors. Right. So Paul was the most successful missionary. I think you and Mike Lacona, etc. will agree with me that Paul was the most successful missionary. Like, who knows what happened to Peter and, you know, all those other people. So the question really arises, why should we believe in Paul? He got into fights with the disciples. Listen, to this. he got into fights with the disciples. Over what? The disciples were the disciples weren't preaching like what he was preaching. And oh, well, you know, well, 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 which, 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 which disciples? Peter, like none of those people, like they, 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 they like, they didn't like him. They were saying he was preaching a different G, but let me, let me, let me finish my point. Where, where, my they, where they say that? Let, let, let me finish my point. Okay. And then, uh, so basically I think why Paul converted, I think this is a issue that I think Richard Carrier had a good point here. I know you don't like Richard Carrier, and I know he doesn't like you, but, you know, we have to take into consideration what he says. He says Paul was feeling guilt. He was feeling guilt, and that's why he converted. It was a guilt hallucination or vision. That's why he got a vision from from uh, Jesus. So Paul wanted to be a leader instead of a persecutor. So these disciples who, according to the Gospels, the disciples are slow, dim-witted, they're illiterate, etc. Paul is the most educated, so of course he's going to— overthrow the disciples he's going to come up with his own death and resurrection for whatever reason just to destroy christianity from within or something i don't know and like i said history is written by the victors so paul's gospel probably uh but he was, he was the victor though paul adds was, paul overpowered everyone the jews the original followers of jesus everyone paul paul yeah, paul, paul paul beat everyone he was so absolutely paul, amazing he was such an amazing misleader and deceiver that he won against everyone. He absolutely overpowered everybody and won to the point yeah. where, to the point, to the point where we have uh history has no recollection of some other Jesus who didn't die on the cross and didn't rise from the dead. Yeah. Paul says I'm crafty. I'm tricky. He says that in one Corinthians. Et so Paul, whoa, 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 whoa. You're, you're not reading that. Paul is one of the most sarcastic writers of all time. You're reading when he says, uh, you, Oh, crafty fellow fellow yeah. that I am. Uh, yeah. I caught you by trickery. You're you're interpreting yeah, him is. as as this is this is the mastermind deceiver saying ha ha ha, I tricked you guys. That that's your theory. Yeah, I mean, my my theory is. Have you biggest. actually have you actually read that by the way? Because Paul goes on this thing of all the stuff he's been through and all his credentials, and he said, "Yet crafty fellow, I am. I caught you by trickery." You're taking that as, "Hey, let me let me give you my credentials here." Oh, by the way, I'm tricking you all. That, that that's what deceivers do. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it's probably like that's Paul. Paul is, Paul is extremely sarcastic. Oh, crafty fellow that I'm like, even in Galatians where he says, hey, those guys that want to search, I wish they just go ahead and castrate themselves. I'm not saying people actually wants people to castrate. He's castrate themselves. He's saying, hey, if you believe that these Gentile believers can get closer to God through circumcision than they can through Jesus Christ, then why not just chop it all off? If chopping a little bit off is going to get you in good with God, imagine just chop it all off if you think that's what gets you in good with God. So this I mean, is we could, we could disagree as theists, we can disagree. I don't think Paul's 
I think Paul is early, but I don't think he's reliable. And my theory that I've always held on to is that Jesus was crucified. He survived and he was taken down alive from the tomb. He was taken into heaven. And then that is, and just, just to clarify, that is a, I do regard that as a superior position to the uh, substitution theory. And I'm glad that in recent years, I've seen more people sort of steering away from just, substitution theory looks like a big, uh, just like a big insult to, uh, to God, it to me. I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense either. Like, why would God allow someone, some, like, there's a story where, like, one of his younger disciples miraculously became Jesus and he crucified him. Like, why would God allow? Like, what's the point of doing that? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and you're right. And in, 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 in some of those versions, it's actually insulting to Jesus, too, because Jesus is like, oh, who's going to take my place here? Who's going to take my place? And someone's like, I'll take your place. He's like, oh, you good. You're taking my place. And so, yeah, God. God is a deceiver, and then Jesus is a coward who who's scared to to face crucifixion. So yeah, it's not a it's not a good look for for anyone. So yeah, I agree that those are that's cool that we're on the same page with that stuff. Well, it's not like nobody volunteers except like the little kid. <laughs> As I'll do it. <laughs> I want to get crucified. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's pretty it's rough. A, it's, a, it's a weird theory because it makes no sense, and uh, it's a theory that I never like understood. It comes from the Gospel of Barnabas. Well, well, the Gospel of Barnabas is a uh, fabrication. I believe it's a fabrication by. Some Italian Muslim. I think yeah. he wanted to like, like make up some mm -hmm. stories. The that's story good. That's good. Yeah, we're on the same page there too. And it's uh, it's uh, we understand. I, I understand that Muslims and Christians can have different views and stuff. But yeah, no one should be relying on medieval uh, forgery, like obvious forgeries and stuff. So yeah, it's good to good. We're on the same page there. Yeah, uh, I, I remember my my dad. He gave me a copy of the Gospel of Barnabas. He's like, "This is what happened to Jesus." So I read it. It was so. It even contradicts the Quran. Did you know that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah, because uh. Yeah, Jesus denies that he's the Messiah, and and there, and there are all sorts of historical inaccuracies. He said, and then we sailed to Nazareth. Like Matt, Nazareth is in the middle of the land. There's no there's no water that you're sailing. You can't sail to Nazareth, and so so yeah, there are all sorts of all sorts of problems. Uh, like, yeah, my dad, yeah, my dad gave me a copy of the Gospel of Barnabas. He's like, this is the true gospel. Then I I, I went online, and then I I found answering Islam's uh web page. They ripped that gospel to shreds. I was like, no, it's, yeah. it's that gospel. yeah, and that's that's good because. Uh, Lots of That's people, like, lot, lots of people from every background tend to tend to agree with whatever you know, what whatever someone from their side or a family member or something presents to them, and oh, I have to stick to this because that's what my side does. So it is good that you're actually that you you can uh, look at these uh, things critically and so on. Yeah. So my dad was like, yeah, just just uh, I, I told my dad about it, and my dad was like, uh, just go do your homework. He you didn't want to talk. <laughs> smart, smart, smart. Uh, let's take a take a take a few more uh, super chats here. Uh, Sahih Muslim Book Five Hadith Twenty Two Eighty Six Preservation. Yeah, that's where Abu Musa talks about uh, uh, tells people to remember to recite the Quran so that they don't uh, lose more chapters. Uh, how could the Savior die on the cross when he doesn't even have a physical body? I'm, yeah, that's a that's a criticism of the Dositus and, and certain Gnostics and so on who believe that he didn't have a physical body. But yeah, that, that's not, that's not us. That's not uh, me and Etesham here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I agree. Jesus was crucified. I, I agree with that. I think that's historically certain. So if you want to nail the crucifixion uh, on me, yeah, yeah I, I agree with David Wood. Jesus was crucified. I think that's as certain as George Washington being the president or Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln being the president or Alexander the great conquering, you know, these lands, I, I think it's certain that Jesus was crucified. Where I disagree with David is the disciples' beliefs, the empty tomb, and uh, the Q Gospel, which taught, which is early, which predates Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which talks about Jesus' disappearance. Now, me and David can have our friendly disagreements, but that's just that's just me, you know. Um, if God can keep him alive after so much torture, why wouldn't He be able to raise him from the tomb? Romans ten nine. Now I'm going to assume Etesham that you and I would yep. both agree. Of course, God can raise someone from the dead. So our agreement is not, and I would agree that God can miraculously sustain someone through crucifixion. So we both agree that God can do these things. Our disagreement is our disagreement is what God actually did. I believe God raised uh, him from the dead. And you believe. He sustained yeah. him. Well, the, there's a major problem with the resurrection story, like I said, is that if you read the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and this is the important part, is that if you read it, nobody sees Jesus rise from the dead. Nobody sees Jesus get resurrected. And the Gospel of Mark ended with the women going to the tomb and seeing an empty tomb. And I have this Bible right here. 
the archaeological study Bible, if you read this Bible, uh, if you read what it talks about in the Gospel of Mark, the ending of the Gospel of Mark, there was a whole ending, the whole resurrection ending was tacked onto the Gospel of Mark. Why is this important? Because the Gospel of Mark is our earliest Gospel. It predates Mark, Matthew, or Matthew, uh, Luke, and John. So that means the resurrection story was added in. It wasn't the original. No, that was, the that, was the, that was the resurrection appearance so jesus appearing jesus rose even in even without the ending no it ends with the empty tomb it ends with it ends with the yeah empty but tomb. Sa- yeah but saying jesus he's not here he's been raised and he's going to appear he's going to appear to you but then it doesn't list the appearances and you have different theories on why that is nabil's nabil's view uh, nabil did his master's nabil did his master's thesis at oxford nabil. huh nabil. yeah yeah nabil yeah. yeah nabil did his master's thesis at oxford on this and his view is that uh when Paul mentions the 500 witnesses of the risen Jesus, that these guys are going around preaching, these guys are going around preaching that Jesus appeared to them. And Nabil believed that the gospel of Mark was written as the sort of background for, because because most of these people were not there for most of what Jesus did. Uh, But Jesus appeared to 500 people. And so... Nabil's view was that the Gospel of Mark is written so that as the background for what these guys are preaching and that the reason it doesn't give the appearances is because that's where you were supposed to fill in the appearance. That's where you're supposed to say, and then Jesus appeared to me and, and here's why. Point is, we, we, don't, we don't actually know why, but Jesus predicts his death and resurrection repeatedly in the Gospel of Mark. You have his death, then you have the resurrection. You're right, you don't have the appearances is... Uh, well, it, it's a uh, you have you do have people who believe that the longer longer ending of Mark is uh, is authentic, and that in in some early manuscripts it just I mean someone just had a copy where the last page like fell off or something like that. Uh, but yeah, that that has nothing to do. You still have uh, death and resurrection of Jesus in Mark, death and resurrection of Jesus in Matthew, death and resurrection of Jesus you, in Luke, death and resurrection uh, you, of Jesus in John. What's that? Are you talking about the passion predictions? Yeah, when Jesus says he's going up to Jerusalem and he's going to die, and on the third day he's going to be well, raised. Two, like- two problems I have with that. One is like, uh, you know, if you read, like, there's something called prophecy after the event. So I think it's prophecy after event. It can and if be, Jesus- yeah. If Jesus did predict his uh, death and resurrection, why in the in the Gospels the disciples are surprised when Jesus comes back? You know, is this because the disciples are slow and dimwitted, or because like it was like they didn't know about it? Like that's that's well. The, kind of the thing problem. is, yeah. The the thing is, Jesus spoke in lots of uh, parables and so on, and so again, they had no concept. They had no concept of a dying and rising Messiah. So if he says, "I'm going up to Jerusalem to die," you're going to be like, "Oh, what's he really mean by that?" And then what's happening? What the heck is going on? Wait, wait. Wait, you were serious about that? You were serious? What what the heck is what the heck is going on here? Um yeah. so yeah, anyway, the, the the point is Jesus' death and resurrection is all over everything we've got. And so if there's might- if there's some other Jesus who didn't die on the cross and didn't rise from the dead, we just have no res- no record of it. And you'd have to say well, well, Paul, Paul is back- the Paul is the all-time mastermind. It goes back to the Q gospel, where I strongly believe that the Q gospel, the Q community, which predates Paul, was talking about Jesus' disappearance, and Paul was the one who made up the resurrection. So that's just me. Uh, well, we can have disagreements. Yeah, we let's, can have our- yeah, let's uh, I don't even know. What, yeah, what are you talking about there? The Q gospel. Yeah, what's, know, like, uh, what's, the, what's the quotation? Uh, oh. It's Jesus says, you will not see me in Matthew chapter 23, verse 29 and Luke chapter 13 verse 35 Jesus says you will not see me Daniel A Smith wrote his dissertation or his thesis that it's talking of the Q gospel which I believe exists you might have disagreements but the Q gospel is talking about Jesus disappearance not his resurrection so again but all, we go but all, so all he all he says is you will not see me which fits perfectly with uh with the resurrection as well so that would fit multiple theories what you're saying is well, here you have Daniel, a, here you have a passage which can be interpreted in two ways we're going to sort of rip it out of the the understanding of that, that in the Gospels David, and so, have you read have you read that book uh, Daniel A Smith uh, the Empty Tomb I no I started reading his book on the post mortem uh, the post mort the the one you were talking about the post mortem what oh. was Q I forget what the title is I've got it around I've got it around here somewhere uh, okay. yeah I started yeah. reading it it uh, was not 
he talks like it's that's assumption language. That's not uh, resurrection language. That's assumption language. Now, again, David, we can have our disagreements. We can have, but that's just my theory. But he believed that, he believed that Jesus died. So I'm wondering where he's getting where it's being I, interpreted. I don't know. Maybe he's a Christian, maybe he's an atheist. I don't know. But I think the evidence shows that Jesus survived his crucifixion. Now, you and I, we can have our disagreements, David. That's fine. But as a Muslim, I even if I wasn't a Muslim, let's say I became an atheist tomorrow, I would believe Jesus was still crucified. But I don't see any reason to believe that he died on the cross. That's just me. I, I don't know. Like, you, we can have our disagreements, but that's, you know, that's just my view. I think my— if someone, if someone was crucified, you would not think that's a reason to believe that the person died? If I crucify you and you're on the cross for six hours, you're going to survive. <laughs> no one's going to die. Like if you crucify me. You know, yes, gonna... you can. Again, if you look, if you can die just from the beating and about a quarter of people did die just from the beating and then they would, they would nail those people to the cross anyway. Um, but if you, if you, if you can die just from the beating or you can die after a period of several days and there are people who went three or four days being crucified uh, it kind of means that you can just die of blood loss at at any point, at any point, the, at any point in the process. So to say why? someone wouldn't die after six hours when you could die after one hour, you could die beforehand, you could die after one hour, you could die after 10 hours, you could die after three days. Yeah, then why in the Gospel of Mark chapter 15, verse 44, Pilate was surprised to hear Jesus already died? That means Pilate— Yeah, because you, you, do have, you do have lots of people who survive multiple days. That's true. Yeah, so why can't God? So God I mean, was working as a theist. I you mean, people, God, people were surprised. God. People were surprised that Elvis died. Doesn't mean he didn't die. No, but as a theist, you and I believe in the supernatural. You That's and I true. believe that God was working. Uh, God was supernaturally working through Jesus. So why can't <clears throat> God keep Jesus alive through the crucifixion? I don't. As a theist, you can't reject my view because my view is based on like the supernatural, the theology, the the miracles. That just, God to, just to be just to be clear, you're saying I can't reject a supernatural view. Like if I if, <laughs> if I said right now, if I said now, right, if I said right now that uh, I'm not actually. Uh, hey, everyone, I'm not actually talking to uh, Etesham. Uh, God is 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 making everyone think that I'm talking to Etesham, even though I'm not. That would be a supernatural claim. You couldn't you couldn't reject that claim. No, I'm saying you can't disprove my claim you, because your 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 views are fl filtering through the lens of Paul and the and New Testament writings. I'm saying they're not reliable. Well, g they're early, but they're not given reliable. what you're saying, given what you're saying, you can't disprove the substitution view either. Because guess what? That would account for the evidence. If I say, but that would account for anything. Anyone can say God is tricking you into believing a bunch of stuff that didn't actually happen. In other words, if I've never existed and God has just my entire, the entire time people are seeing me, God has been tricking everyone into, um, into believing that I'm here. Guess what? You can't refute that. If I say, I believe that, that God created everything five minutes ago and gave us false memories of our entire pasts, I can't, I can't, I can't disprove that. That's just, that's just the nature of unfalsifiable positions. Once you've said, once you've, in, once you've put a divine source of something into the discussion in order to account for, for the data, no, you can't, you can't just say that it's 100% false that, that uh, this couldn't happen because God could do this sort of thing. The question is, why would you believe it's that? A Theolo it's a theological view. As a Muslim, I believe in the Quran is the word of God. You might disagree with me, but I believe that the Quran is the... So I have we have to do history when we're looking, when we're trying to make sense of what the Quran is talking about. As a historian, as a historian, I, I consider myself a historian. I think it's certain there was an empty tomb and Jesus was crucified and Jesus appeared to his disciples. This fits three of five of uh, William Lane Craig's points. Will William Lane Craig always brings up those five points. Wait, wait, just, just, to, just to clarify, I'm not criticizing here. Uh, you believe that Jesus appeared. So wait, just, just so I, I knew you believed in the, based on earlier uh, discussion that we're, we're having along the way here, you believe that Jesus was crucified in the sense of being nailed to the cross, but not crucified in the sense of dying by crucifixion. You believe he was put in a tomb that was later discovered empty, and you believe that Jesus appeared to his followers. What, and so I'm, I'm, you would believe that this is a, a vision, or he actually was, was yeah, there? Yeah, like, like a vision. Um, I, I, I adhere to what, uh, or I agree with the critics of, like, like Bart Ehrman, he says that, well, Jesus came back as visions in, in his debates and his uh, books, etc. So I, I believe that the disciples saw something, because I believe Allah, or God, 
uh, wanted to show that Jesus was okay. So he showed like a vision of Jesus to Peter, James, his earliest disciples. So if the disciples were going around saying Jesus is alive or Jesus or, uh, Jesus was raised into heaven, maybe Paul misunderstood that and said Jesus was resurrected. I don't know. Like, you know, like we're, we're, we're dealing with probability. We're dealing with and like no you one, and I. No one, clar- you know, no one clarified that for him? No, because if Allah shows, if God shows a vision to Peter, James, etc., and the and the disciples saying Jesus is alive, and if Paul is coming like years later and, and misunderstanding it to say Jesus is resurrected, that certainly that can happen, right? Because Paul, again, like I said, Paul was the most successful missionary. Again, David, I'm not trying to like mock your views or anything. I'm not I'm not trying to, you know, hammer my views onto you and stuff like we can have our disagreements, but this is just my theory, is that I strongly believe Jesus is survive in the empty tomb Allah our God raised Jesus from the tomb into heaven that explains the empty tomb uh that as a theo- as a theologian that's what I believe now you and I can we can we can have our subjective disagreements but that's just me you know I mean um yeah I'm not l- l- yeah a little I'm not respectful a little more a little more clarification here because your view does account for uh account for for some of the uh for the for the big facts so your view as you've just laid it out accounts for why people believed that Jesus uh, was crucified, because on your view, he was, uh, also accounts for the empty tomb and for the um, and for the early disciples believing that Jesus had appeared to them. So here's a, here's the sort of follow up issue along theological lines. So when Allah, when Allah. Allah does two things here. Allah does two things, which, as it turns out, were massively, massively misunderstood by literally billions of people uh, all the way down to the present. So, on your view, Allah miraculously sustained Jesus on the cross, but but people thought that he died, so much so that Pilate is surprised that he died. So, they think that he's dead. So that accounts for why people believe that Jesus died. So Allah does something, and he knows that people are going to interpret that, misinterpret that as Jesus being dead. So that's one thing Allah does. The other thing that Allah does is he gives at least some of, at least some of Jesus' followers, an appearance of Jesus, let's say, to comfort them so that they know Jesus is okay. But that gets misunderstood by 2,000 years worth of people as Jesus appeared to them risen from the dead, because people also believe in Jesus' death. And so if Jesus is appearing, then he's, he's risen from the dead. So the question is, when Allah miraculously sustains Jesus throughout the crucifixion, and then afterwards takes Jesus out of the tomb, so he takes Jesus out of the tomb, and then has Jesus appear to his followers. So that's that's three things. So question is, does one, does Allah know that people are going to, comp- the vast majority of people are going to completely misunderstand and misinterpret these facts? So Allah knows that people are going to misinterpret uh, Jesus appearing to die as Jesus actually dying. He knows that they're going to misinterpret the empty tomb as Jesus has risen from the dead and, and left, and they're going to misinterpret the appearances of Jesus as he has risen from the dead and appeared to his followers as the as the resurrected Lord. So one, does Allah know that people are going to completely misunderstand these things and that this is going to lead to the creation of Christianity and, and 2,000 years of Christianity? So does Allah know that people are going to misunderstand all of this? To such an extent that we don't even, no one knows about it until Shabir Ali and you and and a couple others. Does Allah know that everyone's going to misunderstand all of that? And two, is he okay with doing things that the vast majority of people and all, all future generations of Christians are going to completely misunderstand? Is Allah doing things that he knows everyone's going to misunderstand? And two, um... Did he so one, did he know that everyone's gonna that so many people are gonna misunderstand what he did? And two, is he okay with people misunderstanding all of this and sort of starting Christianity as a religion in the process? 
Well, like, like I said, like Paul, I believe that Paul made up the death and resurrection. Paul was the most successful Christian missionary or whatever. So Paul, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, just, just, uh, just, I'm, in a, I'm, I'm just, this is just clarification. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not objecting to what you're saying. Um, you said that Pilate was surprised that Jesus was dead. Like, do you believe that actually happened? Because if so, then that means people are no, actually I, people I believe, are actually reporting that believe, Jesus was dead. Pontus, I believe Pontius Pilate crucified many people, and he knew from experience that in order to die, you need to be there for a few days. Like, crucifixion, death by crucifixion typically took days. Jesus was on the cross, I believe, six or nine hours. Uh, you know, don't quote me on that. Let's just say six hours for sake of argument. So Jesus would have certainly survived. Even Raymond Brown in his book, uh, Death of the Messiah, the two-volume book, he says crucifixion pierced no vital organ. So even Christian scholars are saying that nothing killed Jesus on the cross. So why? No, no, you know, no, why no, no, no. So if, if I say, if I say, uh, if I say uh, you got shot 10 times and it didn't pierce any organs, but you bled out, that does not mean you you didn't die. So yes, yes putting putting a nail through through a wrist here, uh, and through your heel pierces no vital organs. The lashing doesn't pierce any vital uh, organs, but your you you die from you die from blood loss. You die from blood loss and and shock and uh, eventual heart failure. That's what that's what, that's that's the point of people when when they say, "Hey, you don't die from actually you know having uh, you know having your your lungs destroyed or something like that." They're not saying, "Oh, therefore uh, there's nothing that kills you." It's you don't die. You don't die in crucifixion from your from organs being pierced it's you die from blood loss and shock and things like that so then then it goes back to then it goes back to theological view that god supernaturally kept jesus alive so paul was the most successful missionary in yeah. history is written oh, by the oh, pictures oh, 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 oh hang on that, yeah oh, oh hang yeah. on yeah yeah so uh, what i was what i was asking about that was if you're saying if you're saying that Pilate was surprised that jesus was dead that means that people had reported to Pilate that Jesus was dead because Pilate is surprised by this. Now, it sounds like your view is that they thought he was dead, but that was just Allah had miraculously sustained him so he kind of he kind of looks like he's kind of uh, has the appearance of being dead and then they they stick his body in the tomb. But that would mean that Paul doesn't come up with the idea that Jesus died. Paul doesn't come up with that. That view was already there. That view was already there. That was standard. That, that like the people who were there thought that he died. So that's not something that Paul came up with. That's something that Allah made them believe by miraculously sustaining him, but giving him the appearance of someone who had died. So that view wouldn't come from Paul. That view would come from Allah. No, no, because like humans, like humans have their own way of, there's this really good saying in the Quran, uh, uh, God is the best of planners, Quran chapter 3, verse 54, etc. So uh, my point is that the, the disciples ran away from Jesus. They weren't eyewitnesses uh, to what, what they didn't know what happened, according to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verse 50. And Josephus himself saw three people crucified. One was taken down alive. So surviving the crucifixion is certainly possible, according to the ancient historian. Um, Josephus. So again, it goes back to a theological view. As a Christian, you have to believe Jesus died because it's a theological view. As a Muslim, I believe Jesus survived. It's a theological view. We can have our differences in, the in theology, but I strongly believe that the evidence shows that we don't know what the disciples believed, and Paul was the one who was making, making things up, and he was the most successful missionary in his view I agree that the New Testament says Jesus died and was resurrected. I agree with you on that. So if you want to keep pushing that on me, that the, the, the gospel say Jesus died and was resurrected, I believe it. But the problem goes back to, are the New Testament documents reliable? No, they're not, according to your conservative scholars. And, uh, the, and, then, and then we know where the stories came from. It came from Paul, not the disciples. The disciples didn't write down anything. So who knows what the disciples believe? Uh, you can't, you would have to prove that to me. I don't know how you could. It's like impossible to prove what the disciples were, were saying if you're just going by Paul, et cetera. So that's what, that's what I believe. Um, you know, Paul started Christianity, not a lot. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I, I have to say over the years, uh, Muslims have exalted Paul almost to the level of a rogue deity with how powerful he was, right? I mean, yeah. again, rejected, he would he would have been rejected by his fellow Jews, he would have been rejected by the disciples of Jesus and yet uh, completely overpowers everyone. Yet in the 
at the same time, he's claiming to submit to their authority. Hey, whatever I'm preaching, I go up and I, I check to verify uh, that what I'm saying is, uh, is, on, is, is that they're on board with that. And then, of course, the next generation of Christians who knew the apostles, uh, they think that Paul and Peter and all these guys are on the same page. So, yeah, Paul, absolute master mastermind. It's just weird that Allah knows this. He knows, hey, people are going to misinterpret this uh, Jesus being nailed to the cross. They're going to misinterpret the empty tomb. They're going to misinterpret appearances, and it's going to start Christianity. And, oh, this apostle right here, this apostle is going to, going to uh, ease on into there and take over and completely corrupt uh, everything and mislead everyone. Well, but, maybe it, but, it's, but it's theological, so I can't object to it. So. No, maybe, maybe, maybe he was trying to destroy Christianity from within. I don't know. Like, I'm not, you know, like we can just work. I have to work with the information that I have. Right. And Paul was the most successful missionary. Why? We know, quick question. We know, quick question yeah. along those lines, because you, you didn't, you could have you, even with your view, you could have multiple views of Paul. You could say he's delusional or something. It's like, it's like with Muhammad. There are people who believe that Muhammad was deliberately deceiving people. And there are people who believe that no, he was he sincerely thought he was a prophet. He was just he was just wrong. So I'm talking about the non non Muslim views, critical views. Uh, you, so there are people who believe that Muhammad was deliberately deceiving people, and there are people who believe that he was he was he was sincere, but he was he was just wrong. So you can have the same view of Paul. You can say that Paul was deliberately uh, misleading people, um, or that Paul really thought he was an apostle and and he was just he was just wrong. But uh, when you're saying that Paul came up with the idea of destroying Christianity from within. Uh, it, have you thought through that? Like, why would Paul want to do that? It, it, because Paul's original objections to, to the Christian message was that it would it disagrees with Judaism. So why would he turn Christianity into this much bigger thing, which flies in the face of Judaism? If his objection to... The preaching of Jesus is, oh, this contradicts, uh, this contradicts my view of Judaism. Why would he then twist it into something that goes even further, that goes even further, and then spread it around the world so that billions of billions and billions of people are are now on board with it? Because that's weird. I, I I don't know, but what my my views are that the disciples they were not successful in preaching whatever their version of Christianity was. Paul was why Paul would go to these extreme lengths to, you know, distort the message of Jesus, you know, beats. But like Paul contradicts the Gospels, like Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew chapter five verse seventeen to. Uh, 17 to 19, I believe, that follow the law, that I've not come to abolish the law, but fulfill. Paul gets rid of the law. He says, you know, the law is uh, where we're saved by the grace of God or the, the crucifixion is the way to salvation, et cetera. So, so Paul already contradicts Jesus. Now, why Paul would make up this, you know, grand scheme to destroy Christianity from within and why we go through. Wait, wait, how, wait. Uh, how did uh, I was pulling up a passage? How did Paul uh, how did Paul contradict Jesus? Like Jesus says uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17 to 19, I believe, I, uh, Jesus said, I've not come to destroy the law, but to, uh, mm -hmm. but to fulfill. Jesus also says scripture can't be broken in the Gospel of John, et cetera, et cetera. So Paul wants to get rid of the Old Testament and say, you know, uh, focus on the uh, the, res or the crucifixion of Jesus for sins, et cetera, et cetera. Jesus died for your sins. Um, but I thought, I thought the Gospels were inspired by Paul. So why would they contradict him? Well, maybe they have like genuine teachings of Jesus on, you know, like he, some, even like Bart Ehrman says, like, we have to go to the New Testament to learn about what Jesus says. So I agree with him there that that's the earliest uh, uh, record. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, but there is a problem with Jesus contradicting Paul and Paul contradicting Jesus in the, in the epistles versus the uh, gospel. So you do have that problem as a theologian. The so... So if the Gospels say the same thing that Paul said, then that's because the the Gospel authors were sort of brainwashed by Paul. And yet, if the Gospels disagree with Paul, then that shows that Paul was was a was a false teacher and he's preaching something else. Well, maybe maybe the the Gospel writers were getting different information from you know their communities or. Or whatever, I, I don't know, but you know, the, you you do have the problem with Paul. Um, you know, Muslims don't Muslims don't accept Paul. I don't accept Paul because Paul's never mentioned in the Quran. Early, early Muslims did. Early Muslims did. 
Um, like who? Asak? Like who? Ibn Asak? Yeah, Ibn Asak. I believe that's in Tabari. Yeah, they they regarded him as as someone who was uh, who was not one of his original uh, disciples, but who was uh, who was sent. There there have even been Muslim interpreters who believe that he was. Uh, uh, that the Quran refers to him when it talks about the the uh, the witnesses being sent and so on. Um, well, he's not, he's not mentioned in the Hadith or the Quran explicitly. So if, they, if Ibn Usak is just right, like I said, you know, back in my debate with Sam Shamoon, I nailed this point that Ibn Usak was just writing down anything he heard from anybody. Same thing with al Dabra, et cetera. They weren't doing any fact-checking. They were just writing down anything they heard. So if they got that information from Christians, if they're writing down Paul as a disciple, that's, you know, they, they weren't doing kind of fact-checking. They were just writing down anything they heard from anybody. It's like it's like me it's like me quoting, like, the, the Jesus seminar to you or, uh, you know, uh, that Jesus didn't exist or, or whatever. You'd be like, get out of here, you know, where you're just, you know, there's no evidence for that, or the evidence is strong for Jesus' existence, etc. So, Paul, I mean, Ibn Ishaq was writing down anything he heard. From him. Yeah. So, uh, just just so everyone knows, um, the Apostle Paul said uh, that he that that he upholds the law. He just it was that is not the law is not what gets you salvation. Salvation is through Jesus. As far as Jesus saying that he came not to abolish the law but to fulfill. Uh, the normal Christian interpretation of that doesn't conflict with the Apostle Paul. It's that Jesus is saying he fulfilled the law, just as uh, he just as it's it's like in the same sense of Jesus fulfilled a prophecy. Jesus fulfilled it. Uh, so Paul Paul is saying something completely different there. He's talking about like what what uh, what Gentiles need to believe and the people who are uh, t- saying the Gentiles need to uh, adhere to the old covenant. Uh, lot. But let's go ahead and uh, take some super chats. We have to close out here pretty okay. soon. I do have something to do about right. within by eleven. I have to be taking care of what a uh, one of my sons here. Uh, so let's okay. let's, zo- let's zoom through some of these here. Uh, theologically speaking, what is Allah's whole purpose with the widespread false religion of Christianity? D Wood can do the vice versa for Islam. So I guess this is talking about what I was bringing up. Like if Allah is doing these things and He knows that this is going to lead to Christianity, then... What? You want me to answer? Yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's, yeah. Matter of fact, since we have a bunch of Super Chats, let's try and give uh, kind of quickish answers. I don't know. Okay, so, wait, what can you... I'm sorry, can you repeat the question real quick? Yeah, it says, theologically speaking, what is Allah's whole purpose with the widespread false religion of Christianity? So I think this person is thinking how, how I was thinking, that if Allah, if Allah knows what he's doing, and he knows that people are going to misunderstand the crucifixion as Jesus dying, and then he's going to, people are going to misinterpret the appearances as Jesus having risen from the dead, and that this is going to lead to Christianity. Uh, what's the point, if Allah knows he's doing that? Yeah, yeah. like I said, history is written by the victors. The victors can be right, they can be wrong. In this case, Paul was wrong, because we don't know, he wasn't getting his information from the disciples. I strongly believe he made up the whole death and resurrection. I strongly believe it. Now, as Christians can disagree with me, but I think the evidence is strong that Paul was notoriously unreliable when it when he's talking about the the death and resurrection. But my point is that history is written by the victors, whether they're right or wrong. We know that Alexander the Great was a pagan, yet he still conquered the Jews, etc. Like, you know, like why would the God of the Bible allow Alexander the Great to to conquer, you know, you know, God believing Jews and stuff like that. It goes back to history is written by the victors. So Paul wanted to destroy my theory is that Paul was feeling guilt and he wanted to be a leader instead of a persecutor. I agree with Richard Carrier on that. Um, maybe Paul wanted to do like oppose the disciples or maybe he wanted to destroy Christianity from within by pretending to be a leader. I don't know. Uh, but the whole point is that maybe Christianity spread. The whole reason why Christianity spread is because of Paul. If it wasn't for Paul and if it wasn't for Constantine, David would, would not be a Christian. There would be no Christianity today if it wasn't for Paul and Constantine. Paul opened it up to the Gentiles, and Constantine made it the official religion of the Roman Empire. So history is written by the victors, right? So like, why was Christianity um, successful and not you know the cult of Apollonius of Tiana or something like that because of Constantine right Constantine was outlawing paganism he was forcing Christianity he was looting pagan temples and he was you know forcing Christianity on people Paul was the one who went to the Gentiles because Jesus's disciples were limited to the the house of Israel while Paul was taking it to you know Europe to the Middle East to 
other places. So Paul is the is the victor here, not the disciples. The disciples were not successful in preaching their version of Christianity. Paul was. So Paul was the one who was successful in it. Then it goes back to, like, why would God allow that? Uh, well, maybe Paul was, I, I, I don't know, but maybe Paul was more successful and Allah wanted to veil Islam until the coming of Prophet Muhammad, according to uh, Al Qurtubi's view. So that's just my theological theory. Yeah, I did have a I did have a question along those lines that the the apostles were just not uh, not successful, and someone else came in who was more successful. So just wanted to get your view on. I'll just read two quick verses real quick from the Quran. So this is Surah three, verse fifty five, which you actually mentioned earlier, because there's a word uh, yeah mutawafika here. Ordinarily, ordinarily means it, it can refer to it can refer to it, it refers to Allah taking away sleep, your soul sleeper, and can sleeper. refer to and can refer to uh, sleep or can refer to if it's basically Allah can take your soul away. If he res, if he returns it, then you are asleep. If he doesn't return it, then you die. But that's not what I'm uh, that's not what I'm uh, bringing it up for is. Uh, so behold, God said, oh, Jesus, I will take thee and raise thee to myself and clear thee of the falsehoods of those who blaspheme. I will make those who follow thee superior to those who reject faith to the day of resurrection. Then shall ye all return unto me, and I will judge between you of the matters wherein ye dispute. So here, Allah says to Jesus, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make those who follow you superior to those who reject faith. So Paul would be, a, 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 on Etesham's view, Paul would be one of the people who uh, rejects faith. And... Allah says that he's going to make Jesus' true followers superior to the day of resurrection, to those who reject faith. So that's 355, and then we want to get to 6114. Um, and let's see, I'll read Shakir here. O you who believe, be helpers in the cause of Allah. As Isa, son of Miriam, said to his disciples, who are my helpers in the cause of Allah? The disciples said, we are helpers in the cause of Allah. So a party of the children of Israel believed and another party disbelieved. Paul would, of course, be among those who disbelieved. But Allah says, then we aided those who believed against their enemy and they became uppermost. So uh, Allah here says some of the children of Israel believed in Jesus. Another party disbelieved. Allah says he aided the true believers, the true believers, he aided them. He gave them supernatural assistance. He gave them supernatural aid. Allah helped yes. them until Charles. they, yeah, until they became, I just want, I just want the viewers to understand because this, this might be new for them. So Allah says he aided the true followers of Jesus against their enemy until they became uppermost. But it sounds to me like Etesham is saying these guys were weak. They couldn't get their message across. Their message faded out and the apostle Paul won. So according to 6114, Allah helps the true followers of Jesus until they become uppermost over those who reject them. According to Etesham's view, the false apostle is the one who becomes uppermost and the real followers just sort of fade out because they're they're weak preachers and they can't get the job done and apparently Allah didn't help them at all. So which one's right? So yeah, I mean if you read uh well going to Quran chapter three verse fifty five, um it says that, you know, if you read Tafsir ibn Kathir, uh, Tafsir al Qurtubi, etc., it said that Jesus was to be uh, followed, that Jesus' followers were superior to the Jews, etc. Because the Jews rejected Jesus and the Virgin Mary. They would say blasphemous things, according to the uh, Talmud, etc., they'd say blasphemous things against Jesus and the Virgin Mary. So uh, the Quran is basically saying is that the Christians are superior to the Jews and the Romans, the Roman pagans, etc., until the coming of Islam. Uh, the Quran, chapter 61, verse 14, if you read Tafsir al-Qurtubi, it says that uh, in Tafsir uh, al-Qurtubi is a early Muslim scholar. He, he wrote a commentary on the on the Quran, etc. It says that uh, Allah had the religion of Islam veiled uh, uh, um, until you know the coming of Muhammad. But the Christians are superior because they follow Jesus. Jesus is a prophet according to Islam. So the Quran is saying that the, the, the Christians are superior because they believe in Jesus to the Roman pagans, the Hindus, the Jews, who all rejected Jesus at that time. So I think that's what the Quran is talking about. The Quran is saying that Christians are superior to Jews because the Jews reject Jesus, which is one of you know God's 
you know, prophets, but the Christians are at least a little bit better because they accept Jesus. So they're superior to Jews because they believe in Allah's prophet, Jesus. So that's what the Quran's talking about. The Quran is not praising Paul or anything like that. It's just saying that, you know, because the Christians try to follow the teachings of Jesus, whether successfully or unsuccessful, at least they believe in Jesus. So that makes them superior to Jews and Roman pagans and people who rejected uh, uh, Jesus at that time. So th I think that's what the Quran's talking about. It's not confirming Paul, or it's not saying Paul's superior. All right. Muslims have one source on this topic. Christians have the better sources. Muslims have one sketchy dude claiming to hear from an angel telling him what Allah said. This is tremendously problematic. Christian sources more likely. So if we were to flesh out this objection, it would kind of be, well, if you're going to, if you're just going to say the Apostle Paul, if you're just going to point a finger at the Apostle Paul and said, uh, okay, Paul is responsible for all this. When Paul was in a position to actually be verified and confirmed by the people of that time, why wouldn't someone just say, okay, Muhammad comes way later. So if I'm going to say someone's making stuff up or getting delusions or something like that, why wouldn't I point a finger at Muhammad? Okay, so it doesn't matter if the Quran came 600 years later or 6 million years later. The Quran says it's the word of God. How do we know that? The Quran's prophecies came through. Uh, uh, you know, there, we have, you know, other ways of knowing that the Quran is divinely inspired, but we're not going to get into evidence for Islam in, in, in this discussion or this debate. Uh, the Quran, well, first of all, you're just going to the New Testament. There's, that's what you're talking about, right? The New Testament. But I agree that the New Testament is early, but it's early and it's not reliable because, like I said, like I cited Raymond Brown, Craig L. Blomberg earlier in this discussion, that they say that the Gospels are anonymous. They're written by Greek authors, uh, Greek-speaking authors. Jesus spoke Aramaic. That right there, that's a big problem right there, problem with translation, etc. So even Christian scholars are saying the Gospels are unreliable. So if you're saying, well, the New Testament's early, yeah, it's early, but it's not reliable. Just because something is early doesn't mean it's reliable. Just because Ibn Ishaq is early, that doesn't mean he's reliable. Same same issue with Islam. I'm not saying Islam Islam sources are vastly superior. Same same issue. Ibn Ishaq is early. Yeah, it's early, but it's unreliable. As I've said, I don't know, like 200 times on my channel, I've explained why Ibn Ishaq is not reliable. So I agree that uh, the New Testament is early and there's multiple sources, but it's not reliable because we don't know where it came from. We don't know what their sources were. So how can I trust the New Testament? Why am I going to put my salvation on the line, believing these documents written by anonymous Greek authors who had no connection to Jesus? Why am I going to risk burning in hell, believing in those documents, you know? I even told this to David Wood, I'm willing to convert to Christianity if someone can prove that the Bible is historically reliable, uh, you know, the New Testament's historical. That hasn't happened, right? I'm still open to that, but, you know, that's why I'm, I'm putting my faith in God's book, which is the Quran. The Quran can be proven, the New Testament. Ooh, the Quran that uh, affirms that Christians have the gospel? We might, no, we, we might, we might, we might, I don't know what your views are on that. We, we might have to save that for a, for a discussion because that one's, that one would take a bit of time on what the Quran is actually, the Quran's I can, I can, position. I can respond to that. The Quran's talking about the revealed gospel in Quran chapter three, verse uh, three, Quran chapter five, verse 46. Uh, you know, it's not talking about like the New Testament. Right, let's have a, let, let's, uh, let's have a separate uh, live stream on that because. No, let's do evidence for Islam. That's something I really want to do. We can do that That's too. We can do that too. I'd be interested because, yeah, I don't know what your I don't know what your arguments are. So, yeah, we can do that. It's, prop it's prophecies and scientific accuracy. But I uh, like in the last discussion with Shamoon, I didn't get a chance to do it. But yeah, let, let's let's do it. Let's do it. With, let's do it. Uh, all right. So I got to be off here in about twelve more minutes. Let's just burn right. through some of these. Islam teaches, and uh, I'm sorry for everyone who uh, who put in super chats that I didn't get to. I am on a time constraint today. Well, if I'm talking, if I'm talking. Too much, just just cut me off. Just cut me no, off. it's fine. I'll, I'll just try and get through as many as I can before uh, before we have to close out. Islam teach, and some of these some of these we don't actually need to respond to. Uh, yeah, Islam, I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta eat dinner and I gotta finish Spider Man yeah. too. So, so we'll, yeah, we'll be off in about uh, ten or eleven minutes. Uh, Islam teaches to follow the straight path, and Jesus said he is the straight path. Uh, someone, Stephen the Pelted, is rolling in the grave, joking. Oh yeah, really funny to joke about people rolling in the grave. Uh, Big Rig says, "Wait, wait what, what? What do you say? What do you say? What he said? What was uh, he said, St well, yeah, I don't know, because he's Stephen the Pel stuff, Stephen the Pelted, and saying is rolling in the grave. I guess he's talking about Stephen. I don't know. Um, want to talk about trust? How do you trust a being that says they are the greatest deceiver? Do you not see the logical fallacy of saying you're the truth and the greatest deceiver at the same time?" 
Uh, does Muhammad have proof of a flying carpet? No, he didn't fly on a carpet. Uh, look up the miracle of Nohad el Shami from Lebanon and tell me Christ is not Lord. Not sure what that's referring to. I don't know, I don't know what that is either. Uh, it makes sense the New Testament doesn't comment on Peter's death if he was still alive and contributing to it. Also, being internally anonymous doesn't mean we can't see who is unanimously credited externally. Yeah, so they're... Yeah, you have to you have to throw out you have to throw out a lot of tradition from um, from the second and third generations of of Christians on the uh, on the uh, on the sources. But that's a that'll be a topic for a different day. Uh, Carrier thinks Paul and Peter were on the same page about Jesus. Otherwise, Carrier can't argue that the first Christians in the Jerusalem church were worshiping a crucified angel. Um, yeah, I'm, I know Etisham likes Carrier. I've never thought that Carrier was, uh, was coherent, but yeah, we'll not be able to get through all of that. Yeah. Richard Carrier doesn't like you, David. Oh, he really? I have no idea why. Uh, <laughs> Tom here says great beard. We don't know which, which beard you're talking about. Cause there are two of us here. Unless you want to say it plural and say great beards. Then we have, then we're good, both good. Uh, if you're talking about comic fan day, that's me. <laughs> Uh, David, you're being very nice to this guy, but he's dishonest, and you cannot have a respectful debate with a guy who's dishonest. Well, I mean, keep in mind, there are two issues. If someone says something you're 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 disagreeing with, or something that you believe is wrong, you can believe that he's sincere but wrong, right? So I can believe that Etisham is wrong, and I can disagree with him, but still believe that he's he's trying to be right, uh, versus someone who's just like. Lying. So I would, I would normal, I would normally assume that I would normally, I would normally assume that someone is being sincere. Is he a Christian or is he an atheist saying that? Is he a Christian? Uh, no idea. But yeah, I don't. I usually don't judge people's motives until they reveal them. Like you can. Yeah, hey, I've, I've, debated, I've debated people who are dishonest. I've debated James White. He's dishonest. He's a liar. I've debated Sam Schoen. He's a liar too. So you know, I've well, debated is, liar. what you're what you're saying right now. So I believe that you are wrong on a lot of things do you actually believe what you're saying yeah i believe okay. as a as a muslim i i believe what i'm what i'm saying now we can be david we can have our disagreements so you don't you don't gotta call me a liar i mean just because i have a different theological view i mean i think james white's a liar you know you don't, you don't hey don't be attacking every other christian in the world here uh paul's gospel is of hope he was condemning god's chosen people to death he changed his mind for some reason wake up beloved um etishem is painfully dishonest he's jumping around wait a minute is that the same guy no that's a different guy that's multiple people saying you're being dishonest well i mean i don't know why why are you going to james white when he's also dishonest you know why why are you criticizing me and not your own why are you why are you attacking james white these people are attacking i don't you. I, don't, I don't i don't like james white but what's wrong with you why does everyone hate james white <laughs> i don't like him i don't like him. keep up I mean, the liar, liar. Yeah. Oh, go ahead i'm sorry yeah james not just so you know james not crazy about me either but uh uh, keep up the great work, David. And for the Muslim, please, please, please reconsider your stance. See, now that's a, that's a nice, that's a nice response. You disagree with that's them. A, hey, please more reconsider. Sincere, yeah, that's more sincere. Uh, Gabriel himself told Mary that Jesus Christ would be born to her. Even Muhammad would only have had, uh, such once an adult. Jesus must have been special. Oh, so I guess here's someone just pointing out since, uh, in both Christianity and Islam, you have Gabriel doing announcements. It sounds like Jesus is uh, someone important. Yes, I would agree that Jesus is important in both Christianity and Islam. Jesus was crucified for what reason? Actually, what do you want, what do you want me to answer? What, you, you, this, you're saying a lot. this one's this one's actually interesting. Jesus was crucified for what reason? So you agree that Jesus was crucified? Why do you believe that Jesus was was crucified? Why do I believe? Yeah, well, I don't because... mean I don't believe I don't I don't mean why you believe why you believe that there's historical evidence that Jesus was crucified. I mean, what do you think the motive was for the people who crucified Jesus? Well, I mean, just read the Gospels. I mean, read the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus was, you know, uh, overthrowing the the money in the in the temple. Jesus was obviously upsetting the Jews. 
um, et cetera, et cetera, and read the Gospel of John, et cetera. There, the Jews are always after Jesus. Um, so yeah, there is a, there is a bunch of reasons why Jesus was crucified. I just don't believe he died because I believe God can protect. Like, why would God protect Elijah? Why would God allow Elijah to go to heaven without dying? He knocked without. Why why can't God save Jesus? You know, I'm not I'm not being dishonest here. I'm just me and David. We can have our theological disagreements i don't agree with a lot of what david would say but i'm not just gonna say he's a liar you know uh that's just my theological i mean i think jesus was crucified but i don't see any theological reason for it i believe he survived uh but just just read the gospels why jesus was crucified i I agree with the gospels that that's that's the reason why he's crucified all right got about five more minutes at how do you reconcile ephesians 4 9 which states that christ descended into the lower parts of the earth if he didn't die i I think i can answer for you that comes from paul and you would think that paul is wrong there you wouldn't agree with paul right uh yeah Uh, but but paul's letters like contradict each other because paul also says there's one god and one lord in one corinthians chapter eight verse six etc etc so but yeah i'm sorry but go ahead uh and regarding what i just said jesus must have been holier than muhammad and all other prophets it would totally make sense to call him the son of god that so i think the idea there is uh jesus is just really different from lots of other people, not only in, in Christianity, but also in Islam. But yeah, we'd have to save that for a future discussion if you actually wanted us to uh, go through that. Just remember... Do you want me to address any of these? What's that? Do you want me to... Like, I'm, you, I'm, I'm, basi- I'm basically pulling them up, reading them, and then seeing if there's anything we can comment on for the next uh, couple minutes before we have to, have to sign out. Uh, sure. So like this, just remember that demons feared Jesus and Muhammad feared the demons. Not something we really... Looking for stuff that, that's actually uh, connected to the to the conversation. Some of these are, you know, some of these are uh, are uh, some of these are some of these are good points that would be interesting for discussion. Just not with uh, not when I have to sign out in a couple minutes. Um, uh, let's see. Sounds like you're an Ahmadi. No, you're no, not. You're not an no, ah, you're not no, an Ahmadi. You just said. yeah. Your posi- yeah. your position on this issue has some similarities with the Ahmadi position, but well, Ahmadis have Ahmadis yeah. have additional. A lot of Shabir, Shabir Ali is not an Ahmadi. He believes in that Jesus was crucified but survived. It was made to appear to them does not mean somebody else was crucified instead of Jesus. Where like where are you getting that from? Even if you read the Arabic, the Arabic doesn't apply that. So me and Shabir can have our views based on the New Testament and not adhere to the Ahmadi uh, thing. No, I'm not an Ahmadi. I'm a Sunni Muslim. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I guess the position there is you can— agree with an Ahmadi on some point, that doesn't mean that you believe in Mirza Ghulam Ahmed or something like that. Just like a Christian, just like I can, just like I can agree with an Ahmadi on, on some point. It doesn't mean that I, I would be an, an Ahmadi. But yes, it is, it is uh, the position that you're, the position that you're maintaining as far as Jesus being crucified but surviving is much more common among Ahmadis than among Orthodox Muslims. But yeah, so the, the, the oh, Quran, I, at, at the end of the day, Surah 4 verse 157 does allow multiple interpretations. So, yeah, exactly. so me and Shabir Ali, we're not Ahmadis. So. Uh, question for the Muslim theologian, why are you using known atheists such as Richard Carrier for your argument? Richard Carrier would oh. also say Islam is a myth. Just give a heads up. No, I'm just I'm just trying to illustrate a point that Richard Carrier does have some good points. Like, you know, like David cites atheists in, in his videos too. He says, "Well, Bart Ehrman says this." Well, I could say the same thing. Why are you going to Bart Ehrman when Bart Ehrman doesn't doesn't uh, uh, believe that Jesus was resurrected and Jesus is, you know, uh, co-equal with God? I mean, like, why why is David Wood going to Bart Ehrman when Bart Ehrman doesn't agree with his theological views? I'm going to Richard Carrier and Bart Ehrman to just show that they don't believe. In the supernatural they don't believe uh but i can uh take if they have a good point i can use it doesn't matter about their theological um theological views like if i like i think james white's a freak but if he has like a good point then you know i'm gonna i'm gonna use it to to prove an argument you know that just that just me not that i why you gotta keep taking random shots at james white man what's right i I don't (laughs) I don't like him. I don't, I don't like him. He's like him and Shamoon are the worst. Literally. I like, I'll never debate either of them again. Uh, let's see. What is this? Slippery loop? Hey, we're going to skip this one. <laughs> okay. 
let's see. Uh, how does any of this back and forth about what happened make Islam true or better in 2024? Clearly, we all prefer to live in a world that follows Jesus words and values, including Muslim. Well, I mean, something that would something that would make Islam true would be a different discussion. We're, we're discussing uh, yeah. we're discussing views of the crucifixion. But go ahead. If I can, if I can uh, answer that, I'm just saying that the Quran's view or the Quran chapter four verse one fifty seven is can be explained. Like people like David Wood will say, well, that's just ridiculous, and Apos they will say, well, uh, or apostate prophet will say, well, the Quran's just wrong, and Bart Ehrman they try to use. I remember like Apos tried to use Bart Ehrman to uh, talk about the crucifixion, et cetera, et cetera. So, so my point is that the Quran chapter four verse one fifty seven is historically possible. So I'm this is just my views that the Quran is not wrong when it says it was made to appear to them and Allah raised them. So I'm giving my view based on the New Testament studies about what I think happened to Jesus and why that vindicates the Quran chapter four, verse 157. Uh, as a theologian, I'm just giving my my two cents here. Yeah, and I have to say, even though I believe the Quran is wrong, as I mentioned uh, earlier, and as I made an entire video on, I'm not actually convinced that the Quran is wrong in 4, 157 because... I mean, if you had asked me 10 years ago, I would have said that is a that is a dumb historical blunder um, since hearing even from I mean, from, from Muslims and looking at how different uh, Muslim interpreters have interpreted that uh, over the centuries. Yeah, I, I, I can't say that I'm convinced that the Quran is actually denying uh, the crucifixion on there and you do have you do have some uh you do have some different views there uh, all right guys it's 11 i have to jump off right this second but uh looks like uh, i've got more to discuss with uh etisham and so i'm sure I we mean, will what's that I'm, I'm up for evidence for islam or deity or some like christianity something like that some islam or christianity topic what do you think david evidence for islam or something uh, yeah, yeah, because I mean, even there were even a couple of uh, issues that came up. I, I am actually, I'm really interested in the topic of what the Quran is is actually saying about the Christian scripture. So I'm interested in that evidence for Islam. I'm always interested in because uh, I just I've just seen like some of the Dawah guys rejecting some of their traditional arguments now. So I'm wondering um, what the what the arguments are now. So yeah, uh, we'll be having a uh, yeah we'll, we'll be we'll be having future discussions with uh, with Etisham. And notice, guys, we're, we're we're pretty friendly. We're pretty friendly yeah. here. We're pretty friendly when we interact. And so just just so everyone knows out there, we can all we can all get along to have discussions. And uh, again, if you'd like to see some of Etisham's videos, uh, go ahead and check the description box, and that'll take you over to his channel. So check out some of his stuff, and if you disagree with him, let him know why. And uh, if you agree with him, then then you agree. All right, Etisham, thanks for uh, thanks for joining yeah. and for this discussion. Thanks for having me. Thanks mm -hmm. for having me. All right, and I I'll to do this topic for a while. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And uh, all right, gotta go. Catch y'all later. Catch y'all later. Yeah.